I'm back, back in the New York Hardcore Chronicles groove. I'm back, back in the New York Hardcore Chronicles groove. I'm back in the New York groove. What's up? Come on now. You know what we're going to talk about? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. And you know what we're going to talk about today? I'll give you one guess what we are going to talk about today. All right? You have one guess. All right? Spell them out. All right? What's up, Paulie? Checking in from Florida via Long Island. My last show in the New York area before the first time I moved to Florida was Murphy's Law at the Pipeline in New Jersey in 1997. Damn. Yes. Yes. The one thing we're going to talk about today is, is Chacho's Tacos. That is right. <laughs> Funny you should bring that up. <laughs> Funny you should bring that up. Chacho's Tacos, located in Corpus Christi, Texas, opened the doors in 2001, home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home-style Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning. In their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi, swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. We got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. Well, now that that's been spoken about, yeah, that was a good segue, right? Hey, yo, what's happening? Upstate Rick, it's a Wednesday show. That's right. Flan's giving. That's right. Who makes, all right, listen, let, let, let me, let me, let's get this straight. We're going to talk about New York hardcore today, okay? All right? Also, um, we're going to talk about, here, here, here's a trivia question on the show. Who claims to make the best flan in the world? Who makes the best, or better yet, who makes the best flan in the New York hardcore scene? What's up, Dave Martin? Love from KCMO, like always. Well, thank you. I have good memories of, of Kansas City. That's right. Roger Moret. No, not Vlad. Roger Moret claims to make the best flan. No, not Arnie Stone. Yo, Arnie Stone makes good, like, scrambled eggs. And Arnie Stone ain't, ain't, ain't making flan. That's right, Lynette. Roger, Roger, Roger. Yep. Yep, that's right. Hoya Rock. That's right. Roger. We got to get Roger on and talk about. It's been a while. We got to. Yes, we're going to talk about New York hardcore today. No? Eh, Thanksgiving, you know, whatever. Um, Lori Dawn, what's up? Hey, just just for the just for the record, um, we're getting we're gearing up to do a holiday event at Generation Records. It's like a uh, Christmas party, a holiday get together. Uh, Saturday, December eighteenth. It is going to be co-hosted by Women of the Pit. I'm excited to have them aboard. It's, uh, Scott Helland, who was a guest on the show, is going to be performing his Guitar Me of One. Um, everybody's going to be invited. We're getting the flyer together now. This guy looks cold. Yo, you What's cold up? Out? You cold out there, baby? Uh, I like it. I like it. Winter is <laughs> coming. I know. It's only the cold, but I like it. Like it, like it. Yes, I do. New York is, winter. Yeah, man. Where is photo of the day? Hmm. What is going on? Where is photo of the day? What else yeah. going on over there? Oh, not too much. Getting ready for the big Thanksgiving, big family holiday, you know. Today is, uh, today on the railroad, uh, the, the everyone comes home for Thanksgiving means people like to throw up on the trains and get drunk <laughs> and, you know. But I haven't thrown up on I haven't thrown up on a train in a minute, man. <laughs> You know? Luckily, I wasn't working on the job when you did back then. People throwing up on the train, man. Well, that's because you—that's because those trains don't have a bathroom, right? They do, they do. Oh, people can't go in the bathroom to puke. They have to just. Throw oh, they up on do. The train. They do. Sometimes they even puke in the bowl. <laughs> oh man! I, you I know what? I think if I'm gonna puke, I'm just gonna let, just puke, right? Let it fly. No, you don't even want to. We'll get it. We, we can do a whole Patreon episode on horror stories. 
Yeah, like I went St. Into the Patrick's Day. I, I went the day before the Thanksgiving. An abortion. Oh my god. New, <laughs> New Year's Eve. Ugh. You, I went you, into the bathroom in the LII double R and I found an abortion. Uh, I'm like, ah! Uh. <laughs> Yo, shouting out Aaron in Bristol, England. Come on now. Uh, All right. Uh. We're not mad at you, Bristol. We love you. Holidays are coming up, man. Yeah, no, it, people like, you know what? Because they're not driving, so they, they get crazy on the trains. Drinko de Mayo. <laughs> Yeah, listen, oh, happy Thanksgiving from New York Hardcore Comics. You know, I love those guys. You know what? Where's, where's my New York Hardcore Comics shout out? Let's, let's, let's sort of segue this here. Where is it? Happy, happy holidays from New York Hardcore Comics. Of course, New York Hardcore Comics opened. Opened, opened, opened. Back in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music, even if it friggin' sucks. We have in-store <laughs> events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, located at 117 Main Street. Lovely. Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.newyorkparacourcomics.com. That said, let's do photo of the day. Wrong answers only, please. Boom, photo of the day. Ah, uh, that's a good one. What have we got here? There you go. Wrong answers only, please. Is it? <laughs> that You know what? Train bathroom, <laughs> train bathroom abortion sounds like a fantastic death metal album name. You know what? We <laughs> might have to add that. We might have to add that to our list. That's train bathroom abortion. <laughs> TBA. TBA. <laughs> That's right. Train bathroom abortion. Good one. I like that. Is it is it Billy Joel with an IE? Is it Band of Dons? Is it Bad manners. Is it Nickelback? Is it public image? <laughs> Is it Simon and Garfunkel? All right. Is it the Bruce Willis band? Good one. Yo, I saw this thing. I, I saw this, this ad for the Ritz in New York City from back in the day. It was like the month of shows at the Ritz. And the only show that was sold out was B the Bruce Willis Band. I remember when that album came out. He had a hit on that record. Yeah. That Return yeah. of Bruno record. Yeah. He was like, that was like when he was doing Moonlighting still, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's Yeah, funny. ha, touring for Return of Bruno. Yep. All right, let's do another, another one of these. Um... Where's my photo of the day? Photo of the day number two. Here we go. Just for you. This is photo of the day number two. Boom. There you go. Is it skid marks? Is it Brett Michael and CC DeVille? <laughs> is it Santura? Do you mean San do you mean Santana or do you mean Santeria? Is it the fifth element? Multipass. Multipass. Multi Woo! Multipass. <laughs> Damn. Hey, you froze there, bro. So the, the trick here now when Steven freezes is try to replicate, try to replicate his face is to the best of our ability. So did I freeze? You're frozen, bro. Can you Come still out. hear me talk? I can hear you talk. Yep. Good for yep. now. All right. All right. So one more, one more and, and, and let's right answers only, please. Here we go. Another, another Steven Messina classic right answers only, please. Is it Ralph Cramden? Is it Depeche Mode? <laughs> hey, Sid, I sent you a link. What's the matter? You don't want You don't want to come by, come on the show anymore. Is it Fred Flintstone? Is it ISIS? 
I married Isis on the fifth day of May. Right answers only. Come on, anybody. Is it breakdown? Is it Elvez, the Mexican Elvis? I, what, what they don't is, need a hint, do they? Is it Dog Star? That's a good one. All right, what is it, bro? Well, give them a hint that they have something to do with today's artist. Right. They have something to do with today's guest. Yeah. Is In it, fact, is it, is it killing time? There we go. Thank you, John. Is it, is it killing time? Is it killing time? All right. What is it? It's killing time. Yes. In fact, not only is this killing time, this was one of the rare shows of 2020. This was January 2020 at the Amityville Music Hall. And, uh, you know, we still got a couple of shows in before everything went south, and that was one of them. And, uh, you know, one of those bands just, just love Killing Time. Brightside yep. is still in, like, some, one of the greatest hardcore records ever, you know? Yeah, we're going to talk uh, about we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Yep. Oh yeah, I mean, what's up, Ray Hogan? I see you out there. There you go. The, uh, but yeah, these we got to see Gilligan's Revenge right around. Uh, you know, just just any connection with this band. These these guys are all like legendary in my book. You know. Right on. Yo, from Philly. What's up, Lauren? Yo. All right. Well, glad you're Is out. Philly cold right now? I don't know. Does a snake ha I don't know. Does a snake have an ass? You know? <laughs> Does a bear uh, shit man, in the just, woods? <laughs> we just we just played with a great Philly band the other day called the NAD. Yeah. Yeah, they were good. They were really good. Yep. But uh, uh, Lauren says yes. This is also awesome. Lauren says yes, a snake has an ass. <laughs> Do you see the yeah, ass yeah, on that yeah. snake? Uh, Gilligan's Revenge at A7 was awesome, Hags. For yep. sure. Yeah, it was. Yo, Rhett, you think Florida's cold, bro? You better, you better let that fart out, kid, because it was cold here today, man. Yep. All right, buddy. Good talking to you. Well, listen, before I go, I want to just shout out shout Michael Gibbons it, from Leeway. Shout it. Shout it out loud. Shout out Howie Pyro from Degeneration. Wish those guys the best. And wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, you know, and to thank you, you know, for, for being there and making these shows so much fun, even when my face freezes up. All right, buddy. We love you, man. Thank you. Later. Later. Well, there you have it. Stephen Messina, the Hardcore Shutterbug. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. By the way, coming up this Sunday, big shout out Sunday, coming up this Sunday, David Ellison from the Lucid, X Megadeth, uh, Altitudes and Attitudes, F5, should be an interesting, should be an interesting show. Um, he's been doing the rounds lately. You know, let's see what Dave Ellison has to say for himself. You know, we'll try not to get into the sticky stuff, pardon the pun. You know what I mean? And then uh, just want to say that a week, is that a week from today? Yeah, a week from today, another controversial figure, Mr. Mark Nickel from MAD Tour Booking. This should be interesting. This is a guy that brought all the New York hardcore bands over there to play early on. He's an old school thumper. Um, should be good. Should be interesting. So, Mark Nickel, there you go. That said... Um, you know what? How about we bring this guy on? What's up? What up? What up? What up, Drew? Happy what's Thanksgiving, that, what's, what's everybody. That name, what's that name of your, that new band you were talking about? What's your new band called? Oh, I got the disposal of life but the new thing for me is you got to do your first flyer that's my band name disposal of life right on the dl the dol what um 
So I, I have some collectibles, you know. I love it when the weekend ties into the show for me. I had a little adventure in the flea market, so I want to I wanna do it right so each piece gets its little you know time on stage here. I'm just going to show a couple comics because I started off the morning getting a couple comics. Nice little Fantastic Four 20 Center, you know. I like buying the knees for like. That, that, that's my. That's Doom. my. That's my generation. I even recognize that. I even. Re I had that, yeah, bro. Dr. That's Doom. the seeker, bro. The seeker. Yep. Yes, it is. The I Sims had. Seeker. Yo, I had that, bro. But this one's good. A fifteen center, and it's. I had that too, man. Doc. Uh, FF one fifteen. I had that too. Yeah, man. So, and I recently sold all my comics. So these are the last. These are the only, not the last. The first three of the new. Batch. I got this Conan number 22. Pretty sweet. But I really have a flea market story to tell today. And I went out Saturday and I don't like this, you know, I'm not going to spend no $300, but these guys try to like jack you. So I had a thing happen where I was walking by in the morning. I'll make it very quick. I saw some famous monsters magazine in a pile of mad magazines and figured, oh, I could get these cheap. And the guy had a whole song and dance on how they weren't for sale. He's watched them. He's some other guy selling them for some lady. So as soon as it turns into that many people, I'm out of the deal. So later on, I was walking back with my kid past the flea market again. And I saw he had like a bin of toys. And I saw one thing I wanted. And I reached over and pulled it out. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. The, the toys, no, for sale. I said, oh, $300 for the whole bin. And I knew what it was. It was a lot of Johnny West. This is like a little before my collecting, even. Johnny West are like these Indians plastic. So I see the one thing I want. So basically, long story short is I go back early on the Sunday after I have a little blowout with the guy. Like, ah, yeah, keep it. I don't want it. I literally picked out what I wanted, and he threw it on the table. It's not for sale. So I come back Sunday morning now. I go back to the same dealer and everything's still there. And I'm like, dude, you know, he says, oh, and, that, and now it's only 150 for the whole box, not 300 because he sat with it all day. And I'm going to wrap it up. This was the piece I wanted. And sometimes when you're flea marketing, you only want to win. It's not always about the money for me. So in this box, I'm going to reveal it. I saw this zero. And I offered him 30 bucks. He wouldn't sell it. So I came back the next day. And I offered him 40, but the way I got it was this box that it was in was all broken up and I saw something else. So when I saw this other piece, I said, dude, if I put all this together and give you 50 for all of it, I'll give you 10 bucks for these broken boxes. He, he went for it. You know, he did, I didn't buy the whole thing, but I got it's the like deal. It's like something out of like life for Brian. You got to haggle with these guys. And, and, and the coolest part is, for, for another 10 bucks, I got this for five bucks, which is just a, a shelf piece, but it's the Adar model, Cornelius. And I had to reconstruct the box. I did a little bit of double isn't size. Zero, wait a second. Isn't Zero Cornelius's woman? Yeah. So this is how it all ties together. I'm going to tie it all up in a bow now. So it ties together that I got the two pieces of the Planet of the Apes for 40 bucks. And I dropped the guy another 10 bucks because I found another piece of cardboard in the bottom. And this is really, I went from liking Planet of the Apes and collectibles to Star Wars. So then I snagged this bad boy too. For like, I offered him 10 for just this piece of cardboard. And then he went for the whole deal. But you know, the cool thing about this card back is if you could see right there, it says Revenge, Revenge of, the of the Jedi. Yeah, that never was released. So this is a more sold after card back. And also, what's that? You know what that is now, Drew? That's Unpunched. It. Unpunched. Wow. So that's that's got to be worth a couple bucks. You know, probably 20, 30 bucks. But it's a good shelf piece. And it was kind of like, it helped me get the deal done with that guy. And it was kind of like worthless to him. His whole thing was, I was trying to tell him what it was and the Johnny West guys, and that's different. And it's a whole song and dance with these guys. But uh, da, 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 da. it's all about the win sometimes. Like I walked away feeling like I, I, I got him, you know? 
So that was my little weekend adventure, and that was the collectible today. All right. The card back, bro. Look at that thing. Sweet. That's a score right there, bro. Yeah, man. All right, man. Let me bring, okay. let's bring let's bring our guest on. Thank you, buddy. And, and hey, all, hey, man. happy Thanksgiving to you and Stella and Luke. Thank and, you so much. And what's the cat's name? Joe Jimmy Snow. Jimmy Snow. Oh, and I just he was now he's Jimmy. Air. I want to say on air, happy birthday to Stella. Stella Bezotis, happy birthday, babe. Uh, her birthday just passed, and our family's doing great. And thanks, everybody, for all the support you've given me over this past few years. Uh, it's really up the ante of things I want to do. And, you know, so ha let's have a great show, everybody. Happy thanks, holidays. Man. Happy Thanksgiving. And the holidays are here, man. All right, how about it? Let's bring our guest on. Super excited about today's guest is an American engineer and producer hailing from the ocean, ocean state of Rhode Island. He has worked at Right Track Recording, Electric Ladyland, and of course, the infamous Normandy Sound. He was instrumental in creating some of the iconic New York hardcore albums, including Sick of it all, scratch the surface, leeway born to expire, judge bringing it down, marauder master killer, killing time bright side, Cro-Mag's best wishes, crown of thorns mentally vexed, scatterbrain here comes trouble, 24-7 spies, gumbo millennium, and many, many more. Please welcome, coming at us from Montgomery, New York, Mr. Tom Sorez. Hey, man. Hey, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> I'm not How used to being on these things, so bear with me. You'll be all, you'll be fine. Yeah. Take my hand, bro. Oh, ah, where is it? Where is it? You'll be you'll be fine. Let's uh let's jump into it, man. Um, you know how how did you? Well, first off, what's the latest? What have you been doing since the zombie apocalypse? Uh, how you keeping busy? And, right now, and, and I'm like, working on right now. I'm working on an album for uh, uh, John Purcell from Shelter. It's mm -hmm. a the Spanish artist, female artist. Her name is Chewy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working on that for a while. And uh, before that, uh, you know, stuff here in the some R&B crap, stuff like that. And my, I guess my last heavy album was the Terror Band, Terror. You, you, make, yeah. you mixed the Terror record, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, don't, what's, what's, your, what's your straight gig? My straight gig that pays my mortgage is uh, I'm an audio engineer at CBS. Uh, I work on a on a sports show. I do the audio for a sports show. Yeah, you work with Boom. You work work on the Boomer Science show. Yeah, right? Boomer and Geo in the morning. And were you you were able to do that from home during this whole thing, right? Yeah, right from where I'm sitting right now. Well, you I can't beat that with a baseball bat, right? No, oh, man, I tell you, I, <laughs> I'm 80 miles from the city, so driving at two o'clock in the morning to get there for four sucked. It sucks now because I'm back, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no. It's, and, it's and, and, and you're not really a sports guy, right? You know what it is? I, I work on so many sports shows that I don't watch sports, listen to sports, because all I do right. is hear it all, all day long. You know what I mean? Hey, you know what? This is this is funny right off the bat. Sid says, nothing says OG like that cassette boombox in the back there, Tom. Now, I know I know a little bit about that that particular boombox, right? That's a that's a boombox that you pull out. And you play your mixes on, right? T tell us about like. I don't only play my music mixes on it. I mix to it. I mix to it because you, you. I mean, you can't EQ things and stuff like that for, but for balances, if it don't sound good on that, it does not going to sound good on anything. You know and, I mean? and you've had that a long time, right? Oh God, uh, twenty five years. It's all busted up now, but it still works. That's I got it taped together and shit. You know? <laughs> So, so I don't, I'd show it to you, but I'm afraid to touch it because like the back is like half <laughs> on, you know. But that's uh, awesome. But yeah. yeah, I had to tape the front because the cassette it's a cassette player and a cassette door keeps opening every time you put a kick drum through it, you know. So uh, I mean, I mean, I know some I know some people take their mix and get in the car and and like you know and listen to it in the car, you know. Like I, I guess that's true, right? You could listen to it in front of the console on these great friggin' speakers. But what happens when you get out the door? That's right? exactly what, yeah, that's exactly right. It's like, you know, I, I mean, my monitor system, I got, you know, $20,000 speakers I'm, I listen through. Right. But, uh, 
it, it you know it's it that has it's good for me to work but in the regular on the on the plan on, on the planet you gotta listen to that nowadays it's all these little white earbuds you got in your ears you know what i mean yeah, it's yeah. gonna sound good on that yep. so the dynamic range is so much limited that uh those big speakers and stuff like that it, it, it unless you know really know your speakers it's not gonna translate so yeah. you've got to listen to it on what the average person listens to it on you know a lot of times i just when i listen to a mix i'll just turn the speakers on and walk out and walk down the hallway and i listen from down the hallway to listen to the mix it's interesting you should say that because a lot of times you know i go to shows i actually enjoy listening to show like when i go to a show because my, my hearing is, is 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 god it's pretty bad I, I have to wear i wear hearing aids now but um like I go to cons I go to shows. I like standing outside on the sidewalk and listening to the band. Mm -hmm. I like 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 it's 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 too much for me at this point. Well, the thing about doing that is that uh, you know you you be working on a mix and we you know you work on songs for hours and hours and hours and you kind of sometimes you lose a little perspective from it, you know, and you're saying to yourself, you know, what's wrong with this mix? I can't figure it out. And then all of a sudden you walk down the hall and you, you hear the, ah. the fucking hi hat and screaming. Yeah, and right. you come back I in it. and it's like oh, and you just turn the hi hat down. And the whole mix makes sense. Then you go back out and listen to it and say, yeah, that sounds but sometimes you just miss that by sitting between these fucking bullhorns all day long, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So so tell us, how did you come up? Did do you did you grow up in a musical household? How did music come into your life? Uh well, I'm Portuguese. And when you're Portuguese, you either learn how to play the accordion or you become an altar boy. <laughs> I was both. I was, I was both. But uh yeah, so I I I learned how to play the accordion when I was maybe six wow and i played the accordion for a long time and uh so i was always around music but how i got into the studio was my sister uh became she was she played accordion too but uh she wanted to be a recording engineer so she got a job at normandy like in 19 oh god 1971 72 something like that and uh i used to go up there and hang out and listen to music and you know, they had nice. Well, well, when, when you were, when you were growing up, is that right? Lawrence Welk was was your hero. Is that right? Um, <laughs> no, um, Lawrence Welk wasn't my hero, um, but it was on every fucking Sunday night. But what 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 music? What what drew you to music? Like what artists did you listen to? You know, grow that. What what made you want to get into a, into this in, into a recording studio? Like, well, I always liked singing when I was younger, and I I love um, I liked like. All my friends who listen to the Beatles and and sure. Led Zeppelin and stuff. I was listening to the Commodores, honest to God, Sly yeah, and the Family you know. Stone. Those yeah. are the bands that I listen. I just like that. Oh music. hell yeah, yeah. You know, so I was into R and B and soul music. You know, and especially uh, especially growing up where it, you were growing up in Rhode Island in what the late sixties, early seventies, right? Yeah, late the early sixties. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, did, um, did Rhode Island have a summer of love? I mean, did did, did Rhode Island? No, I was not that young. I was not that old. No, I, <laughs> I, I was born in '61, so you know. Okay. I when I was uh, I, I was listening to um, whatever was on the radio in the, in the towards the late '60s. Like my first single was uh, "Tears of a Clown." Oh, that's by um, Smokey Robinson. Did, 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 my second, miracles, right? My second, yeah. My yeah, second yeah. song was "Hurdy Gurdy Man." Oh, by Donovan. Donovan. Donovan yeah, right? and then then after that, it was like uh, "Sunshine of Your Love" by Cream. Come on so, now. So so you know so it's like yeah. I just listen, I just loved music and I loved singing. Yeah. I didn't know who half the artists were. I just like to sing on the radio. You know, sure. listen to the AM radio and just sing. Yeah. And uh, one thing led to another. I started hanging out at the studio, and back then, if you were an assistant, you uh clean the toilets. Made coffee. Well, well, let's 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 back to it. So your sister actually got a gig at Normandy at Normandy Sound. She yeah. was working there. And then how did that lead? And then what? You would just come in and say hi. Yeah, once in a while I go and hang out because it was a cool place. They had these huge speakers. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And all this fancy knobs and stuff like that. And right. even though it wasn't really fancy back then, because it was uh -huh. only back then it was only 16 track. There wasn't even 24 track yet. Wow, and you know, and, and did uh, Norm did Norman did Normandy had sixteen track back then? We had, yeah, we had a sixteen track. It was a big, huge scully, like it was. I mean, the machine was probably six feet six feet wide. Wow, you know, and it was really unreliable and it was hissy, <laughs> and you know what I mean. And it was, yeah. But that was the tech. That was the technology back then. There were a couple of big, huge speakers hanging on chains. It was a very simple yeah. place, but they always uh, the guy who owned the place always cared about 
wiring and good monitoring and stuff like that. So the studio was always one level above all the other studios in the area uh -huh. because uh, even though there wasn't a lot of fancy equipment in there, what was in there sounded great. And yeah. it was all about the microphones and the wiring. Having when great you say wire. wiring, do you mean like the patching? I'm talking about the wire coming that you plug the microphone in coming into the wall. Okay. You know, a lot of people they wire studios and they wire it with like Belden cable or something like that. I see. And the and then all they're doing is turning knobs trying to get something to sound right. Ah. Well, if you have the, if you have great wiring and good microphones, if we go out there and you put a mic on something and it sounds good in the room, if you mic it halfway decent. When you come up, if you got good wire, when you bring the fader, it's gonna sound, it's gonna sound relatively what it sounds like, what it sounds like in the room. Okay. You know, so the uh, the man, anyway, I know there's, there's a guy who's on here who said he's an up up and coming engineer. Mm -hmm. The object is not to press buttons, not have yeah. to press buttons. Uh, you know, if you have to press a button, you gotta you're trying to fix something. And I was always taught, out there is where you get your sound. It's not in here. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the guy who taught me, his name was Phil Green, mm -hmm. he said, Tom, this is just a big stereo with, with bass and treble and some reverb. He goes, but if it's a shitty sound, it's just a shitty sound with more bass or more treble on it. <laughs> you know, that was a, that's a quote, you know? Right. So I, I, was, I always learned that way, that everything you want, you needed to do, you need to learn outside where the, where the, where the, where the musicians were. You know, of course. Yeah. And uh, and you started basically at the bottom uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning cables and cleaning. cleaning toilets, yeah. Because right? back then they used to make you wipe down the mic cables so that the art, the artists, when they came in, because, you know, mic cables get filthy being on the floor and stuff. Sure. And then sure. if someone picked up a cable, moved the cable, you don't get your hands dirty. Yep. You know what I mean, that was a big thing in that studio, stuff like that, yeah. you know, like making sure that the clients, the, the clients felt with the were there to create stuff and not have things bothering them. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes a dirty cable will bother someone, a guitar player especially. Sure, sure. You know? And and and, and I, I came, to, I've been up to Normandy a bunch of times, uh, a couple of times, but I, I would assume that in those early days, it was probably, you know, a pretty, really nice, close to a state-of-the-art studio, correct? Yeah, it was, yeah, for, for what there was, you know, for, for what the technology was. I mean, we had a big Scully tape recorder, which wasn't wasn't like, the top, top, top of the line, but uh, it's it's what they had. But everything that was there, like the console, was a handmade, discreet console. Wow! You know, so it sounded great. The console sure. sounded great. The microphones were really good. So even right. though you were there a bunch of times, it wasn't fancy. That wasn't a no. fancy studio. I mean, if you no. walk into some place like the Hip Factory or something like that, it's absolutely gorgeous and it's yeah. you know, top of the line mahogany. All of no, Normandy wasn't like that. No, it was a place you could come spit on the floor pretty much, and no one was going to throw you out, you know? Now, now this 16 track, was that 16 track 2 inch or 1 inch? Yeah, 2 inch 16 two track. Inch, 2 yeah. inch 16 track. Then yeah. We, yeah then, and there was a DBX noise reduction. It wasn't even Dolby, it was DBX noise reduction. Right. And, and for outboard gear, there was an EMT plate. You familiar with plate reverbs? It's Slightly. like a big, huge plate. Uh -huh. it's a, and then there was like a spring reverb, like, like you would have a, it was a bigger unit, but. Like something you'd have on a guitar, you know, like in a guitar amp. Yep, yep. And um, like a digital delay, one digital delay, and any other echoes were done with tape recorders and tape loops and stuff, stuff like that. You know. Wow. And, and that remember, stuff took that stuff took time too back then, right? Well, I that's mean, that... see, see, that's the thing. Back then, when we were making records, you were creating stuff. Yeah. The the the, the Pro Tools and all that stuff is great nowadays, and it, you know, blah blah blah, but. It's a it, people like to use Pro Tools like it's some kind of magic thing. It's basically a storage medium, and that's the way I like to use. That's the way I always like to use it. Although now that I'm mixing at home in the box, I have all the you know tons of plugins and stuff like that that I use sure. for effects and EQs and all that other stuff. But uh, it, it's it's I don't I don't know. It's uh, you back then if you only had 16 tracks, right? Yeah, you got drums. The drums usually kick, snare, drums. Boom. That was four tracks. If they, right. sometimes yeah. it was just two. Yeah, yeah. Then you had a bass track. Then you had, if you had a couple of guitar tracks, what you had to do was you did the guitar on the left and you made the sound. If you wanted echo on the guitar, you printed it with echo on the guitar. If you mm. wanted a flanger, oh, well, gee, we didn't have a flanger. You know what the flanger was? Me with a microphone in the studio, <laughs> spinning it over the top of my head. Before before they created a little, it, it, in a little exactly, box. Exactly, you right? know, and, yeah, and, yeah. and it would be like, 
you know, the, there would be a speaker with the with the guitar being sent out into the studio, mm -hmm. and I would be like this, twirling twirling the microphone over my head, and the engineer would be like, slower, slower, faster, 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 slower, slower, sure. slower, faster, faster, <laughs> and that's that's how you that's how you made a fan of Flandre or a Leslie sound, stuff like that, right. and. Uh, you, so you, if you recorded that guitar, the next thing you put down had to work with that. You know what I mean? Because you, were, yeah. if you were putting a piano, you would have to get a sound for a piano that worked with that guitar. And you built the song so that when you were done, not did it only didn't only just sound like a song, but it had an atmosphere because you were creating sure. it as you were going along. Nowadays, sure. you record a guitar. All right, now I'm going to put some effects on it. And da, 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 you know what I mean? Well, now nowadays, nowadays uh, correct me if I'm wrong. From what I understand, which was. A quite a revelation for me because I wasn't in the recording studio for a minute. Now uh, they just want a clean guitar signal because afterwards you can make it sound almost like any way you want, right? Well, that's, that's funny you mention that because like now I'm mixing a lot in my house, right? Yeah. And uh, it's like when I when I when I when I like I just did, I did Tara's album. I told Nick, I said, Nick, send me. I don't care if you send me guitars with amps on them, but I want you to send me a direct guitar, like I just see. plugged straight into a direct box. So sure. I had a clean, clean, dry, clean, dry signal, and using amp modelers and stuff like that, I can pretty much get almost any sound you want. And a couple of a few tricks that I know how to, you know, putting atmospheres on stuff for you. I beg, I bet you can't tell the difference. It's a, it's not an amplifier. Yeah, makes sense. You know. So let's uh, let's jump ahead a little bit, uh, and, and, and let's jump right into uh, this leeway born to expire, which um, is really this is a iconic crossover uh, album that really uh, was you know looked upon as a, a real groundbreaking record now correct me if i'm wrong uh, or, or tell us how this came to be i know there was something before it and but how did how did you end up uh, on this project well before i had never i had never heard of hardcore da, 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 and i had done this band the first album i did was a band called wargasm which is kind of like a speed metal band from sure. boston and, and, that, um, and that's that's Rich Spielberg. Yeah, and, and Rich Spielberg. His brother yeah. Barry played drums. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. what the thing was is like their stuff was so fast and so complicated. At Normandy, we had been doing a lot of fusion, jazz fusion type music, <laughs> was where it was very, you know, intricate and very complicated. So I learned how to get small sounds that wound up making everything big. Mm. If you know what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Well, when I st when I, when this band came in, and they're like, I'm like, well, how am I going to approach this? So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to approach this like recording fusion. And I made a bunch of smaller sounds, and then picked one sound that was going to be big, which is which was Rich's guitar, and the drums. I made them clean and bright and clear, and uh, you know, not a lot of bass on them because when someone's playing at 186 BPM. You can't put a lot of bass on the kick drum because you're not you're not gonna hear any clarity because it's so it's gonna be more of a, a pointy more pointy sounds. And uh I did the album the short story long, and uh it was they were on uh they were on Chris Williamson's label, and Chris heard the record and went, Oh my god, uh I don't hear you anymore. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They were on Chris Williamson's Rock Hotel, Rock imprint, Hotel. which was yeah, which was a subsidiary of profile records. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excuse me if I forget a few things. That was a long, long time ago. Yep. But um, he heard the record and said, oh, my God, who did this record? And he had the vision that he wanted his hardcore records that he was starting to do mm -hmm. to have this big sound, but clear. Because a lot of right. the hardcore records were like, you know, they, were, they sound like two microphones in a room and a guy screaming. For, sure. For pretty much. So, sure. he, it was, so uh, he says, I got this band I want you to do, this band called Leeway. So he did a lot of pre-production with them and really worked their ass off. And then they came into the studio and we started recording and it, uh, it, it came, it came out to be this. And uh, from then that, when this album came out, that turned my life around because all of a sudden it was like, they came, uh, uh, Chromax came, uh, sick of it all came, you know, and all the other, and all the others followed that. And right. they just, the albums just kind of started getting more, rounded and developed and developed as I started doing them and they started sounding bigger and um, uh, more produced, I guess, if you, yeah. if you want to look at it now, that now, way. Did you, now, now, I know there's the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, you're known for, for, for the amp cabin. 
which is something that I recall, you know, you would build. Explain to us like what the AMP cabin uh or, or as much as you're comfortable giving away your no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll draw you a damn diagram. No one can do it because of yeah. Tell us, tell us about what the amp cabin is. All right, the amp cabin is. I had originally heard that uh, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top was um, touring with his amp inside a box, pre mic'd with his sound. So I started saying to myself, "Wow, that's a great idea." So what I did was I I took. Two Marshall cabinets with, I mean, two Marshall heads with four cabinets, two slants and two straights. And I would arrange them with one slant, one straight, eh, one slant, one straight, one slant, one straight. So it was a square, but it really wasn't a square because if you make it a square, it's you, you won't get any base because there'll be phase cancellations. So one of the cabins is offset slightly so that. And, and, and you can adjust how much base you're getting by how far you angle that, that last cabinet. And then uh, the, the uh, one, one amp had usually some kind of distortion box on it, either the TC box or a uh, Boss Super Distortion, something like that, whatever the guy had. That would be plugged into this, the, the, this one head, and, and it would be the two cabinets. This, this, ca this head would power this cabinet and this cabinet, and then this head would power this cabinet and this cabinet. Got it. And you'd mix and match, and da da da. And I, I used four different kinds, four different microphones. I used a, a fifty eight on this one, a U eighty seven Neumann on this one, a four twenty one Sennheiser on that one, and then a Bayer eighty eight on the one that was open, the, on the cabinet that was swung open. And I, after doing it um, three or four times, I started getting the hang of how how it was going to work or I could set it up and I knew it was going to work before I even went into the control. When I first started doing it, it was those face cancellations everywhere. And it was like, but I just really didn't give up on it. And then this leeway album, this leeway album was all about AJ's guitar, believe it or not, yeah. and the drums. If you listen to the record, there's not that much bass on it. That was mm -hmm. done on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, it was to showcase AJ's guitar and, and vocals. And that was the, that was the vibe for the album. Sure. According to Chris, that's the way Chris, you know, that's the crazy, that was Chris's vision as the producer. Right. So we worked real hard on the, on the guitar sound. And uh, I think, God, I, it might have been a, a day or two we worked on the guitar sound. You know what I mean? Tweaking this, touching that, little moving this until finally, bam, it was there. And by that time, I had figured out, I had figured out the amp cabin. So, uh, you know, we did the album and everybody loved it. And I, I was like, everybody raved about it. And I was really happy with it. I wanted more bass, but that, but I, you know, that was an argument I lost. Right. And then, and then, you know, I know, I know we're skipping around a little bit, but we're going, we're going where the horse, where the horse leads us. Um, you know, I know the leeway thing really put a call out to a lot of people. A lot of people heard that leeway record and said, we, we, we want to come up there. You know, we want to come up there. And we want to we we want to uh, you know play and I, I, I we want we want to record up there and I know I'm skipping around here but you know we we have a guest that's tied in with this and we want to bring him on in a couple minutes but you know that's what I'm assuming you know what let's just bring him on right now what the hell come on hey, hey buddy good service here right here. oh my god Johnny what's up Johnny can you hear me Johnny what's up brother <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Priscilla? I can hear you. I'm in my car, brother. Why are you right. always in that fucking car? Not much, man. No, why are you always in that Dude, fucking car? Every it. time I talk to you, you're in your fucking car. Hey, 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 Purcell. I stuff to do, us, dude. Purcell, tell us a little bit about what drove you to go up to Normandy initially and record this. Uh, well, we had originally done that, that Judge record. We had we had recorded the whole thing that became Chung King. We did it at um, at uh, Chung King Studios, and you know, for Judge, we were really getting ambitious. You know, we had this kind of metally hardcore sound, and we wanted to make a record that was great and not just good. <laughs> and we wanted to kind of expand and push the envelope a little bit. So originally, we went to Chung King because we wanted to go to a better studio, and they put mm -hmm. us in the topmost room which was like it, it was we were really let down because when you think of chung king you think okay it's this professional studio it was actually a tiny room 
oh. with a tiny board. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't impressive whatsoever. So it didn't come out good. We were still ambitious. We threw away all the money. We said, you know what? We're gonna go wherever they recorded leeway and whenever they recorded Chromax best wishes. That's where we want to go. <laughs> so I literally revelation paid for revelation said, okay, you can do it, but we can't pay for the whole thing. We'll pay for half. I emptied out my bank account. Nobody else had money. I emptied out my bank account and we went to Normandy. And I tell you, when you walk into that place, it's so impressive. <laughs> it looks like it looks like one of those studios that like Led Zeppelin would record at. You know what I mean? Huge Neve board, huge live room. I mean, we walked in there and we were like, "Oh my God, this we're we're in the big leagues." That's how we felt. That's and awesome. I remember, I remember Tom. You know, the first Judge record, the Judge single, New York Cruise single. We recorded it. We recorded and mixed it in three hours. And that was only with two musicians because we didn't even have a full band. It was just me and Mike. Me and Mike, I did one guitar track with Mike playing drums live. Then I quickly overdubbed the guitar tracks. Then I did a bass track. Then I did a lead guitar track. And then Mike did the vocals. And then we did the backup vocals. Everything was practically done in one take. And then we mixed it in three hours it cost 75 dollars and i wow. remember when we came into normandy with tom tom spent the whole day tuning the drums <laughs> he's such a perfectionist this guy he's in that room like a mad scientist with the drums all day long tick 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 turn turn the screw tick 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 turn the lug nut it, it literally it took him all day to get um to get the drums set up with the drum sounds. And we were like, what is up with this dude? Like, we didn't know what to expect, but the guy is just, he's a perfectionist. He knows, you know, he takes the time to get incredible, incredible sounds. We worked on the drum sounds that whole day just to get sounds. We didn't track yeah, anything how that it sound? Day. Remember that, Tom? Yeah. How did it now, sound? Yeah, hey, hey, and Tom, Tom, I know, Tom, I know that you, you, you told me, Tom, that um, the, the Judge Bringing It Down record was the first time that you really you used a bunch of, you got some effects going. Look, yeah, give, lots give us, of. Give us a well, little background. Give like, us a little like, background on that. Well, but like John said, they wanted a whole different kind of level of record almost. So, you know, that's like, like, like songs like the storm and stuff like that. They were like so many different things that we, that we did to get sounds and, and reverbs. And, and, uh, we had an acoustic chamber at, at the studio and, uh, you know, John wanted sometimes to put some stuff on his guitars. It wasn't just straight guitar, you know, yeah. loud guitar in the speaker. And uh, it, it, we approached it a little different. So it wound up having that 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 atmosphere I was talking about a few minutes ago when, when we had no tracks, 16 tracks, so you had to make it something mm -hmm. as you went along because we also didn't have any effects in Outboy because back then they didn't have effects. We had, yeah. we had a plate reverb and a tape recorder for, for tape delay. So, you know, since we, when John got there, we had a much, the studio had been rebuilt, like to be a much more professional place than in 1974 when I was, when I started sure. there, sure. you know, so, uh, you know, it was, it was it, we had 48 tracks at that point and studios, studios instead of a Scully tape recorder, lots of outboard gear, a lot more microphones. So we, you know, we, so we took advantage of it and I, I was able to have enough time not as much as i wanted but enough time to actually do stuff and john was john was you know john was into it so it, the the album had, ended up having a pretty good sound of it you know what i mean it, like a like a, a, a vibe yeah i mean and we all, sell, we, we, oh, go ahead go ahead i mean you probably know better than me john we also used the amp cabin and i was just fascinated by it and you know even to get that guitar sound you know i love the guitar sound i'm bringing it down we spent hours and hours, you know, when you make the amp cabin, you know, we would get a sound and then Tom would go out there and I would watch him. He would move one of the mics like a half of an inch and it would completely change the sound. Wow. So to play, to place those mics perfectly to get those sounds, I mean, it took hours of just micro moving those microphones around. It was a real, yeah, and, and Tom, 
to put a whole bunch of tape around it so nobody would touch a microphone once we got well, yeah because you know yeah because drummers they tape. like to just wander around you know what i mean drummers like to wander around oh gee sorry i kicked the mic it's like all right back to back to two hours to get this back to where it was before you know yeah so, yeah so. but um yeah. but it ended up sounding great and you know you know one other thing that I, uh, that i really remember from that session is that you know i come from the punk scene it's just like you go in the studio you you just capture the energy most of the stuff is done in one take but tom worked worked much differently than anybody that i had ever worked with before like he's a perfectionist in the best sense of the word like I played the song and I thought, man, that's pretty good. And he was like, no, that wasn't good. Your time is all over the place. Like, what are you talking about? You got to do, you got to do that again. Like he was such a perfectionist. It actually, I'm, I'm saying this quite honestly, by the time I got out of the studio recording that judge record, I was a much better guitar player. Wow. Well, then, John, if you remember, if you remember what I would do was, was like, say the song was at 176. And John would be ju -ju 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 -ju, and then he'd try to double it and it'd be glug, 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 all over the place. <laughs> so so like trying to play that fast and accurate, I'd say, all right, you know what? I'd bring the click down to 120. And I'd say, John, play it at this speed. And he'd be like, dump, 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 dump. I say, see that? If you can't play it at this speed, you can't play it at that speed. So I would sit there with the metronome and go, play it at this speed. And I make him do it like five, six, seven times till he was playing it the way. That it was nice and in rhythm. It's like boot camp. It's and like I it's turn it up to I turn it up to 124, 130, 136. And if the song was at 176, I'd end up, it would might take, it might take 45 minutes or an hour, you know, to, to get it there. But I'd end up at like 190 or 195. And I'd have them playing it great at 195. And then that way, when you played it at 176, it was easy. You know, you know what I mean? And it was so much tighter. And it, and I did this with a lot, of, a lot of bands. No, it wasn't just John. Almost every hardcore band I worked with, because th number one, most hardcore bands don't pre-produce properly. They run through the songs and they, oh, sounds good, and you know, they never really rip it apart to see what every, well, all the parts are playing so that they're all tight. So if you listen to the guitars on that record and all the records I've done with John, when he's going, it's not like this. It's a and I would, I would get it so tight. And that there was there was sometimes where I would shut the drums off and just have John playing with the bass in himself, and the guitars would and, and what that does it lines up the frequencies so that if you have one coming out of the speaker at slightly different time than the other one, so it's going like this, you don't have a big sound because it's mushy because the the low hmm. frequency waveforms are coming out of the speaker at a different time. Okay, so if Makes you get sense. twenty feet away, it sounds big. Be yeah. like listening to it from one speaker. But if you're trying to listen to it and you're trying to get big, huge, chunky guitars, if they're not doing this, making both speakers move at the same time, at the you know at the same time, you wind up with instead of bump, 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 you wind up with you know what I mean. And what that does takes up space, so you, so you don't get a good clear kick drum. It takes up space, so the bass can't do its job. It takes up its and harmonically it goes all the way up to the top octave, so that. The whole thing just sounds like a wall of shit, 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. So like I was saying about, about the, the fusion stuff, if you make things precise, then it makes one, it's like an orchestra. It makes one big, huge sound. I don't know if anyone in the audience here has ever listened to an orchestra play, but when they're warming up and they go, ah, and they're all playing the same <laughs> note and it's from, from the, from the contrabass all the way up to the violins, wow. it's this huge one big note sound. Well, the object of doing that when you're, when you're recording stuff, and then when you're trying to build harmonics, if if they if they're out of place with each other or, or even more out of time with each other, you you can't get a big huge solid sound. It's just never quite sounds as solid as you want it to. And uh, well, by the time John by the time John got done doing that, maybe two or three times in a couple of songs, I didn't have to tell him anymore. He was just he just he was like, all right, give me the metronome. Because if he had a trouble part that he knew was funky, instead of just glossing over it and getting to the next part, he, he would, you know, you would work on it, and make sure the timing was right, and figure out where he was doing it, where the timing, where he was having problems with the timing. You do it at a slower speed, figure it out, get to play it at a slower speed, so that when you play it faster, it gets easier because it gets easier and easier and easier to play. And then, you know, now I mean, I'm working on it now with with John right now, and it's like. 
John, do the guitars. He sends me the guitars, and they're like solid as a rock. You know That's what I mean? Awesome. Because, yeah, so I do what, what he did say. I, he wasn't the only person I did that with. I, I did that with a lot of a lot of musicians I worked with, and I'm glad that I can say I think I probably did do what John said. I helped help them become better players. You know yeah. what I mean? Hey, John. And, so, so uh, Purcell. So I guess it's a testament to uh, you guys working together. All these years later, you still have a, a relationship, and you still trust Tom uh, with your stuff, right? Without a doubt, I think he's the best. Yeah. Thanks, John. He he he, re he really is because. You know, he's got he's got big producer knowledge. Yeah, and it's even like when we get guitar sounds, you know, before I before I met Tom and started working with Tom, it was like, okay, you just get a guitar sound, you get a bass sound, however you like, almost like live. But Tom's thinking, where are the frequencies of these of these instruments gonna fit in the mix? You know, the bass has to be low and then, you know, the guitars are here and, you know, the, then you have the drums down here and then you have the vocals over the top and all this stuff. It never even occurred to me before. You know, I'm just this punk rock kid from New York. <laughs> it, it really helped me to season of, of thinking like sounds and where things lay in a mix. And, you know, even with um, even with bringing it down, it was so funny because I was originally going to play bass on the record because we didn't have a bass player because Jimmy, you had quit right before we did the record. Oh. And I started doing the bass tracks. And after 10 minutes, Tom, Tom is like the drill sergeant in there too. He doesn't like, he doesn't mince words or, or make it polite. <laughs> I was in there for 10 minutes. He just goes, stop everything. Stop what you're doing. Get me a bass player. Get out of here. You can't play bass because you know, I wasn't a bass player. I never played bass before in my life. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm playing a bass. He goes, you play bass like a guitar player. I need a bass player. And oh, so how, did this, got, so how did this get solved? That's when we got Matt Pincus in the band. Matt uh, Pincus was, was the bass player. and He came in uh, after Tom threw me out. And that's, <laughs> how Matt Pincus, that's how Matt Pincus joined the band. Right. I'm not going to say, I'm going to say who, but I've sent a few bands home. You know what I mean? I've sent yeah, a few bands he, that come in. You know, it's like, oh, we want to do a record with Tom Sawyer. Da, 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 da. We're going to do They come up to Normandy and they set everything up and they stop playing. And I go, stop. Guys, you don't have a lot of money. You're wasting your money. Go yeah. home, practice for two months, and then come back and we'll make the record. Because what you're going to get, if you want your record to sound like this or this album, you want it to have the power of this album, you're never, ever going to get it. You're just wasting your money. And then you're going to be unhappy with me. You're going to be happy, unhappy with the record. You're going to be unhappy with the studio. Everything's going to be unhappy. It's going to be that record. So that he in, was other words, to make in other words, pre-production pre is essential here. Pre-production is everything. Pre-production yeah. is everything. Because let's face it. I mean, I do Erica Badu's albums. She spends a million dollars doing an album. She's in yeah. the studio for months and months at a time. And everything is is the way she wants it. She's very, she's, a, she's brilliant. But there's... Um, but there's, but even she does a lot of pre-production. But she's able to do a lot of that in the studio because she's got that. She had, well, she used to have that budget. Hardcore sure. budgets are what twenty. The well, at least back then, yeah. Ten with John, ten grand, <laughs> twelve grand to make a record, a hardcore I record. She, John, I think she. I, I think John. I think we spent like seventeen making bringing it down. Ooh, that was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. No, back then that was a lot. You know what I mean? So bands would come in with ten grand that and they set up, and it's like, guys, you're never even going to get tracks you're going to use, and, and you know what I mean? And you're going to be unhappy with. Go home, practice, hit, buy a metronome, go home, practice, practice the parts, practice everything, then come back. Now, some bands that I produced, I actually went. To New York, or you know what I mean, or wherever, and was in a little small rehearsal studio, like just working on, you know, let's work on this chorus because going from the verse to the chorus, the drummer is like doesn't know where fucking one is, and if the drummer doesn't know where downbeat is, the guitar player sure doesn't know because he's trying to play with the drummer, and, it, and then you just wind with a mushy mess of garbage. So it's like yep. <laughs> and, and sit there and, and just work and work on that transition. For, for an hour or two hours and then work on the next part, then take that part and put it with this part. I know it doesn't sound like fun, but Tell, making records uh, making records a lot of time isn't fun. It's work. You know what I mean? The fun is when you when the fun is when you get really good at it and you're 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 in there performing. Cause on top of all this 
technical crap that I did, I still wanted it to sound like the guy was playing the guitar and enjoying himself playing the guitar, not just a technical, you know, robot shit. Because 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 that that's just as bad as being unprepared, have being being like so technically focused where you're not letting the little things go by and and just letting okay. the guy play. You're gonna let the guy play. You know what I mean? But then the but but, but before you play, you know what I mean? You gotta do this. And then it, it takes, um, let me just finish and I'll, I'll, I'm not going to try to be long winded, but um, say it takes, a, a song is four minutes long, it takes four minutes to play. All right. I can take an hour, I, I, say it takes an hour to do it. I can take 55 minutes getting the sound and doing all that stuff and then five minutes to play the song. Or I can get as quick a sound I can get because you have no money. And you and you don't you know what you're doing, and then take an hour or an hour and a half to play the part, and but and you get someone trying to play a part for an hour and a half, they're gonna suck at it, okay? And they're gonna not want to play it anymore. They're not they're not gonna play it the way you want them to play it, although we even the way they're trying to play it because they played it so many freaking times. It's you know what I mean. It's not fun. People to play get burnt anymore. out on it. Yeah, yeah. It just it's not fun to play anymore. So if you do your homework ahead of time, luckily, I had John who was. Who was well, when he heard the drums, you know, the drum sound that we got, and blah blah blah, and, and he started playing the guitar. The guitar sound was great, he wanted it to be great. So, when I said, Listen, we got to do this, all right, he was patient. I don't know if that was the Harry in him or what, but he was patient. And then, <laughs> and, and and so, then the as we started doing the album, and it was like he was expected to do, he was expecting that, so it was easy, you know. Good. Hey, uh, Purcell, I want to thank you for stopping by. Any, anything you want to add to the mix on the way out? Anything you want to say? Anything you want to, sh anyone you want to shout out? Um, well, you know, we also worked with Tom on those two shelter records too. I yeah. Mean, Tom, Tom, of Tom was, he was the mastermind behind the whole sound of mantra. Cause we kind of mm. went in there and we had this idea that we wanted it to be a little bit more, I don't know, mainstream is the word or kind of like a little bit more, a little bit more sheen to it. So if, you know, back then punk was getting so big, it, it wasn't too far fetched that we could have something on the radio. And so we went in there um, and kind of like had a little meeting with Tom. And I think Tom, he just sort of perfectly captured that sound. It was still powerful. It was still, you know, our sound. But it was just kind of produced enough where, you know, we had that song, Here We Go, that actually got on MTV and, you know, became a huge hit in South America. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I must say, I really, really enjoyed recording with Tom all these years. I think the guy's a genius. Um, he's uh, still working with him today. Me and Tom are working on some, some new music with a new band. That's fantastic. Um, loving, lo loving how it's going to come out. So, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't recommend the guy enough. I think he's one of the, one of the last of these kind of like amazing producers that are out there. Well, well you're also, you're also thanks. open to, uh, you're also open to it because when you see what you can, you, when you see what you can accomplish in the studio, see that's the thing. The good thing of a good of a good producer or engineer is to not just capture what's there, but to push them to do something they think they can't do. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, I'm, this is this is this is how I do it. You know what I mean? But then when you when you can get them to let go, and they can perform and do things beyond what they thought they can do, that's when it really starts to get good because then they start thinking of ideas and start wanting to do it better instead of just yeah. getting through it. You know, it makes a, I mean, and sure. that makes a big huge sound a big difference in what the album sounds like because Fantastic. everybody's energy is anybody everybody's energy is coming together at that point you know hey purcell yeah, thanks a lot I, for stopping by i, I also want to say this go ahead go ahead <laughs> um, tom sang most of those harmonies on mantra <laughs> oh wow is that right actually, tom is like harmony genius like when it comes up to actually like you know because shelter came in shelter really we didn't really do too many harmonies we did them a little bit but um, not only did Tom come up with a lot of those harmonies, he actually sang a lot of them. Wow, and Tom, his, the secret's out. 
Nah, that wasn't supposed. To, that wasn't supposed to be. That, I, that, I let him say that if he wanted to say it. I wasn't <laughs> going to tilt my horn on that. I just, I just did what I just did what had to be done for the for the sake of the record. You know what I mean? And and that that was it. That was it. That was cool. it. You know. Hey, Purcell, we're, we're going to keep it moving, Purcell. Thank you All so right, much. I'll, I'll Johnny, talk to you soon. Up. All right, Tom. All the best to you, brother. All right, bud. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Wow. Well, there you have it. Hey, Tom, I'm going to take uh, a sponsor break now. We'll come back. We got Jimmy Hazel from 24-7 Spy standing by. Jimmy, we'll I'm going to... And we'll see you in a little bit, okay? I'm, I'm going to take I'm gonna a pee break. A... I'll be right back. You go do your thing. Well, there you have it. Boom. Always macking, never lacking. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and... Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of CDs, shirts, stickers, packs, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them. www.chainreactionrecords.com. Come on now. The Organic Grill is a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 123 First Avenue, featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News. The dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on their menu can be made gluten-free. This year, they're celebrating their 21st anniversary and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing, clean food. They have now fully reopened. Get your ass down there. The Organic Grill, www.theorganicgrill.com. How about last but not least, DTFM Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's industrial district, shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistrict.com where the motto is death to false metal. Hey, want to do a couple of shout outs here. Just a couple of reminders. Um, want to shout out uh, Johnny Rock. Um, he's got a show coming up here in New York City at Lucky 13. Big shout out for patron Johnny Rock. Uh, Saturday, December 4th, his band Omnism. Uh, Omnism. Am I pronouncing that right, Johnny Rock? Omnism. Come on now. And if you're wondering about Omnism, go check them out at Omnism Band on Instagram. This is at Lucky 13 in Brooklyn with Meriden Dawn. Uh, is that Tombstone? Tombstone? Tombstoner? Is that right? Tombstoner, uh, America's Deathbed, and Omnism. So there you go. Uh, oh, I got it right. Thank you, Johnny. Omnism. They're, they're here. They're now. They are Omnism. Um, that said, um, there you go. Omnism. Tombstoner. Okay, Tombstoner. All right, got it. From Drew Stoner to... to to Tombstoner. There you go. Check out Johnny Rock's band, Omnism. Uh, also, want to mention um, a couple of upcoming, these are the next next four shows coming up here on the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Wednesday, December 8th, Michael McDermott from Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. And formerly of the Bouncing Souls and Murphy's Law. On Sunday, December 12th, this is Boston, not LA, 40th anniversary celebration. Sunday, December 19th, ooh, Kevin Seconds is coming on the show. What's up? Wednesday, December 22nd, Mike Bromberg from SFA and Go. He used to, he had the fanzine, of course, Bullshit Monthly. Lots of cool shows coming up. Don't be scared. Take my hand. Um, want to mention my patrons. I want to shout out all my patrons. Uh, my new patrons, Terrence Cullinade, Brenda Cato, Chris Goldbach, Michael Duff. Welcome aboard. Uh, Sebastian Gargone out in Long Island. Hey, for all you patrons out there, as if you did not know this, the New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1, 1980-1989, the second printing of the book is on the way. It is free. If it's free, it is for me to all the patrons out there. So come on now, 
Get with Patreon. All you got to do is send me the shipping and your and your address. Um, this is going down. Second printing of the New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1. The first printing sold out in three days. So there you go. Um, yeah, you know what? Funny you should ask. We're getting the holiday show together now. Trying to, I'm trying to book that now. Um, got a couple of irons in the fire for the holiday show, which is going to be Sunday, December 26th, the day after Christmas. We're going to do a show. Um, I'm actually actually talking to J.J. French from Twisted Sister. I'd like to get him. If not, we might just do a holiday show and invite a bunch of people on. Um, don't be a Patreon. Join Patreon. The book is freaking awesome. Uh, the, the book is going to be uh, the, the uh, pre-order link uh, for those that aren't patrons is going up on Black Friday, day after tomorrow. Uh, the book ships three weeks from then, I think uh, the 18th. So there you go. That's the latest on the book. And by the way, you know what's cool? I got to show you. I got to show you this that the our, our friends at Cortex in Berlin, Germany, the book is on the charts. We're big in Germany. My book is number six on the Cortex chart. Antidote Scarred 7-inch is number five. And we have a track on the Strength and Unity compilation number three. So I got a lot happening on the charts in Berlin, Germany. So there you go. Uh, Book, what is that, Rappos? What did you just flash? What did you just flash, Rappos? What was that? Oh, uh, I gave you one, huh? You yeah, got one but, too. Uh, I just realized now that you're doing a second printing, this is, I'm going to have to get assigned number 15 of 500. That's pretty good, man. That's low. So congratulations on the book, man. I'm happy, you know? Thank you, buddy. I, I'll, I'll get, I'll get another one for you. Absolutely, man. Yeah, and for those for those that don't know, uh, here's a page from the book. This is pretty cool. Uh, this book deals th – this page deals uh, with Lamours and all that. Um, you know, Alex Kane, and there's a lot of cool stuff in this book. This book took five years to put together. So not that I was, not that I was uh, working on it for five years straight. Here's another page from the book. If you haven't seen it, it's pretty cool. Got some great pictures on there. Um, cool stuff, you know? Yeah, definitely. Some, A, some A7 pictures and all that. All right, Rad, I'll talk to you in a bit. All right. Later. So there you go. Buy the book. Yep. Tim, you got number 13, bro. You're a heavy hitter when it comes to – you're one of my, my staunch supporters. On pay, you know, I tried to give the low numbers to all the Patreon people, you know? So I, I appreciate it. I knew the book was going to do good. I didn't think it was going to sell out in three days. But, you know, that, that, that's how it goes. Oh, by the way, regarding, uh, speaking of all that, uh, Sunday, December 5th at the Bowery Electric, Sunday matinees are back. Uh, the Take, Antidote NYHC celebrating the release of Scarred, Enziguri, Non-Residence, and Fire is Murder. Come on now. We'll see you down there. It's free. We're doing cool shit down at on the Bowery as well. That said, I think I, I covered everybody. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think we're good. Let's, let's, uh, I got everything. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, why not? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the show, Brian, and we'll see you down there. Um, thank you, Tim. Yeah, I'm bigger than the bad brains. I'm I'm bigger than the bad brains on the chart on the chart, Roy, in, in Berlin. I got three things on the chart, yo. Big. Yo, Sean Brennan, what's up? Come on now. Sean Brennan plays guitar in Antidote NYHC. Here you go. Big shoes to fill. Sean Brennan stepped in. We're working on some new, new material now. I'll see you at rehearsals. Yeah, I know, right? It ain't easy to get people to play free shows, man. But pe people want people want to get down, you know. Any Peter Wolf stories? That's interesting. Wow. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Let me let's bring Tom on. Hey, Tom. Yeah. I don't know about Peter Wolf, but you 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 of course I, worked with Marky Mark in the in the Funky Bunch, right? I did. Pe I did Peter Wolf's Longline album. Oh. Yeah. 
That was any, very any memories of the Wolfman? Uh, he taught me how to drink bourbon. <laughs> he taught me how to drink bourbon. That was uh, that was an amazing record to make. The musicians on that record were fun. What record was that? Called Long Line. It was a record called Long Line. We did it at that place, Longview Farms, out. Oh in, yes, uh, of course. And before it yeah, closed. Yeah, that's where the Stones shacked up in exactly. Jay Giles did all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, there. that's. Yeah, we uh, we went. We started the album on September. 25th and we stayed there till november <laughs> living there it was all oh, was, was that was that was freaking awesome listen right? that's when that's when record labels had budgets for guys like that right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's when, they were, that's when they were budgets and but it's yeah. like peter made it peter peter had made i mean i was i i remember listening to peter on the radio when jay giles band when i was a kid so sure. he taught me a lot of stuff about making records you know what yeah. i mean his yeah. vibe his vibe was, uh, you know, we get up in the morning, eat breakfast because they cook for you stuff. We go in the studio, and he would come in in the morning from the night before and start yelling, not yelling, but berating everybody and get everybody, depending on what song we were doing. And he would get everybody so agitated that when we came into the studio, every that came out in the music, you know what I mean? And then no matter what happened during the day, you know, the vibe would get better and da 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 It would... um. At, at that nighttime, he, he demanded that we all got together and had a few drinks and laughed and talked so that all that energy was gone. Stuff like that. And he would say, hey, Tom, you're the captain of the ship. You're the captain of the ship. How long yeah. you need to get a drum sound for this song? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, call us when you're ready. So I'd sit there with Dave Stefanelli, the drummer, and da -da -da -da, and then, then, then uh, uh, the bass player would come in, and then the two guitar players come in, and we'd work on sounds. And then uh, but those guys... It was all about working on the sounds and stuff, and then Peter sang live, you know, with a fifty set, with a U with a SM fifty seven. He's a that's a old that's an old school dude right there. He was a oh, DJ. Man. He was a DJ before. Like I, I saw him play right before the maybe, maybe, maybe before the pandemic, and I don't know. He's in his seventies. He was really great. He was really good, dude. If you ever went to his apartment, every square inch of his apartment is out as an album. Yeah, he's uh, and, and in Boston, every square inch of his album of his of his apartment is is album shelves. His whole he doesn't have any furniture like uh, paintings on the walls. It's just all bookshelves with albums. That's that amazing. guy's got every record I think probably ever made. You know? Hey, let's let's uh let's let's talk about this record that you were involved in a little oh! bit. Oh, you know, let, let's talk about Gumbo Millennium. And yeah, what uh, do you want to know about that one? How, how did this come to be? Who who brought this? Who brought this? Oh, one the, in? Howie Abrams, man. Howie Abrams, the man. The, yeah. the, I can't shout him up out enough. He's a, he's a he, that man. That man is a genius. Uh, he hooked me up with 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 uh, these guys, and um, from what I remember, they had just come off tour, so mm -hmm. they were tight as a bastard. Plus, they're like probably probably some of the best musicians. And band I've ever ever worked sure. with, as far as like their their glue, their their coherency, as far as them playing together. Uh huh. And they came in, and it was that that was that was might have been one of the easiest records I've ever had. I ever wow, made. That's a, and that says a lot, man. That says a lot. Uh, there was none of that tempo stuff. There was none of that stuff. No, it was just like get some time. Anthony Johnson, great drummer, great drum sound. Uh, Rick Skater. No EQ, no bass, uh, no compression on his bass. Didn't need it. Jimmy right. had his whole rig all with all his sounds and everything all ready to go. It was basically plug in. I think God, I think I got the drum sound in, in maybe two hours, an hour, an hour in that for that album. Uh, let's uh, let, let's let's bring Jimmy on. Hey Jimmy, brother. Hey, can you what's hear up? us? Hey, what's up, y'all? I don't know, he's up, frozen. Tom? Come on. He's kind of frozen. Yeah, that's what happens when you wing it, you know? What's Joe? What's up, Jimmy Hazel? Nice to see you. I we can hear you a little bit. You're, you're you're a little bit frozen. Can you give us tell us a little bit something about recording with Tom and about this record? Okay. Hopefully hopefully you can hear me. Uh, yeah, I can hear Tom you. Yes. Is a genius, sonic genius. You hear me? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, me? but go on. Am I there? 
I don't hear you guys. All uh, right. I'm not talking. I'm listening. No, this is not good. Okay, I'm just I'm just gonna keep talking. Yes. Tom is a genius. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. When we came into that room, the plan for us was literally to make the file harder than you. Um, we'd written a bun song on the tour over the course of the year. And it was, uh, I, ironically, it was Leeway's Born to Expire album um, that had hit so hard with us. And I was like, man, man. I would love to work with that dude. And how he was like, I must make it happen. And literally, when we got there with Tom Spy. Oh, he's breaking up. Process. What Tom uh -oh. did because Tom. Yeah. Can we re sign him back on again? But Tom also. Um, Aside from being a sonic genius, which I have to say, Porcello is absolutely right. Tom is like the best kept secret in terms of vocals. Am I breaking up again? Am I? Where am I? Am I? Am no, I, you're, you're, am on, I here? You're, you're on a roll. You're good. Keep going. Keep going. Oh. Keep rolling. Oh, okay, good. So you know, so Tom would just Tom would have suggestions, and Tom literally was just. What are you asking for? You do it. You, got to do. you do it, you do, I'll do what I do. And together and Tom and sit at the console every day. Because nobody else worked like I like to work. I like to be there. Um, I would sit with Tom, I would listen, I would observe, we would exchange ideas, we would talk about tones, and everything was just right there. We we came in with our homework prepared. Um and we got it done. And and the cool thing finally said um called Don't Break My Heart, which was like we called Z Song Evil. But Jeez, we got Tom song. to sing with us. And Tom <laughs> sang um Yeah, we called it <laughs> All right, hey Tom, so any any give us some more perspective on this. Uh Jimmy um, Jimmy like likes said, to be there. J Jimmy like said, yeah, the Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy is like um, the, the the whole band. They they were just like well seasoned, well oiled machine. Very great musicians knew exactly what they were looking for. You know what I mean? It was like we know we want this. Once once we got the sounds, it was we we I think we read made the whole album in nine days from start to end. Wow! And it was it was ninety ninety eight percent of the album is live. It really wow. is. You know what I mean? It's it's them and, and it's that the record, that record, that record smokes, man. It's the band playing, maybe some guitar overdubs, you know, some vocals. But it was like, and then mixing it, it was, it was like, put up the tracks, almost everything at zero, and it's and the band just mixed themselves. Mm. You know what I mean? Because Jimmy had all his pedals and all that. So when he wanted to be louder, he was louder. When he wanted to be heavy, he was heavy. When he wanted to be mellow and and clean he was mellow and clean and so it's so so it's just a matter of me i i like to record guitars in the control room i don't like the the, the glass and i, I like right. the guys to hear it coming out of the speakers so i right. would just sit there and as long as i had a good drum and bass mix just and then a good level for his guitar i just sit there and he'd play with his pedals and just do whatever he did so when you were done it was like put the tracks up boom you know what I mean? It's done. It's it, so it was like that. That album was that was the one of the easiest albums, and I do have to say, probably one of the best sounding records I've ever done sonically. Well, we, we I had Jimmy on the show recently, and I did my homework, and and I listened to you know I revisited that after many years and listened to that whole record. It, it still sounds great. Another record I want to ask you about uh, is this here, and you told me a, a story, and I like you to expound on a little bit about how these dudes, these dudes basically, uh, and I'm quoting you, came in on a Thursday afternoon and walked out on Monday morning with an album. Exactly. Could you, could you, it was, that, it was, there was, it was, I think there was 19 songs on that album or something like that. It was a, well, granted the, the songs were only like two minutes long, but yeah, still, yeah. you know, sure. but uh, sure. that was another Howie Abrams brilliance. You know what I mean? 
And, uh, you know, the guys came in, I met them. And like I was telling you uh, uh, during our little pre-production meeting that, uh, you know, I would, they had no sound, basically. So me and Howie kind of made the sick of it all sound. You know, you had this this really large Tony guy who was a drummer, who was like freaking huge, who like sounded like a cannon when he hit the drums. So I just had to capture that, you know, and uh, it's, yeah, and Pete and and Pete, he had a guitar sound, but it was kind of thin and, and and really really loud, but it didn't have a lot of definition. So we worked on that a bit. Once again, the amp cabin, and uh, and the funniest thing about it was I I would say to uh, to Pete, Pete, you gotta do that guitar again, and he'd say, Tom, I'm not a guitar player. This I have here is how I I'm a performer. I use this instrument thing to perform. <laughs> so he right. was, if you want, I'll do the guitar again. No problem. But I don't think it's going to come out that much better because that's not what I, I'm not, I'm not this seasoned guitar player. That's not what I do. So he would do it. And he, he would actually improve the part, you know, get it a little tighter. But it's, at some point it's like, uh, it was like, if I try to do something like that to this band in particular, it's not going to be this band. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. This band is loud. This band is raunchy sometimes. This band is just like on fucking 50. Not, they're not on 10. They're on 50 all the time. And if I tried to make those guitars too polite and perfect, loose vocals wouldn't have wouldn't have had the impact that they needed to have. Right. You know what I mean? Because he was part, that that band was more like one big instrument than it was players. It was about capturing sort of the... the yeah, the, like the, if you the, notice yeah. Pete's vocal, I mean, uh, Lou's vocals aren't that loud in that because he's almost like another instrument in the song. And you know what I mean? He's not like the lead vocalist, even though he's the lead vocalist. The way the way that album was approached was like, he's part of the band, like in the band, not in front of the band, if that makes any sense to, to everybody. Yeah. And Craig Satari sent me... Um, hey, Craig. Yeah, he sent me a message today. Uh, what did he say? Uh, hold on. He sent me a great message. I mean, it was still a drill sergeant, but, you know. <laughs> uh, but Do you know um, Do you know the guys from Urban Blight? Ba basically, here, here. Uh, this is what Craig, Craig said to me. Um, Tom turned me, Craig Satari, this is, this is now, Craig told me he was around for that sick of it all record. And then he was in there with, then, then he would join sick of it all. And he was in there with agnostic, he was in there with agnostic. For, I mean, I mean, you've probably worked with Craig Satori many times. Yeah. And, and I quote from, from Craig, Tom turned me into a professional. I was an amateur before that. He taught me how to be a pro in the studio. Basically I was a live performer and he schooled all of the New York hard, all New York hardcore on real deal studio work. Technically and grit wise. Oh wow, that's nice. nice. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. I mean, uh, the guys from Urban Blight used to call me Little Caesar. They even made me T-shirts that said right. Little Caesar on it because I was a drill. I was a drill sergeant in the studio, and it was mainly because bands had no money. Right. So whatever time they had, whatever money and time they had to spend in the studio, I wanted them to get the best that they could get. You know, because they were listening to some of these larger budget records that I was doing. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And they they were coming in with no money and expecting their record to sound like that. Well, you you know? you mentioned this to me before. Now now let me just say Hoya from Madball says, "Born to Expire" and "Best Wishes" were the records that opened the doors for hardcore bands to go big on the production. Thank God. Now you you we we've talked before, and you mentioned to me like you know it got to a point where people you you'd hear from hardcore bands you go, "We want to get you know we want Harley's bass sound and Paris's guitar sound," and your response was my response was. Get me Harley's instrument, Harley's rig, and Harley, and I'll guarantee you it'll sound just like Harley <laughs> playing the bass. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Bass players, bass is funny. Engineers don't get bass sounds. Bass sounds get bass players get the bass sound with their left hand. That's why I told Purcell, take that yeah. instrument off, get me a bass player, because he was playing like a guitar player. Sure. So every bass player has their own sound. And for an engineer to sit there and tweak, uh, bass players are either great or, they're, or they're, they, they either have tone or they don't have tone. Harley had fucking tone that was like off the plane. Har Harley Flanagan is an incredible bass player. Absolutely. He's absolutely incredible. And, 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 and I must say that the bass sound on Best Wishes is incredible. Well, that's, that's Harley 
playing through his rig, which was uh, oh, let me see if I remember, SVT cabinet, an acoustic. Right. It was like fucking eight, I don't know, five, six taller than me, and a Marshall right. amp. And those three combined wow. made that tone. And then it's Harley playing chords. Harley was like, always playing, always playing chords and stuff, you know? Yeah. And his, you know, his his picking hand, you can't say, I can't even describe how how Harley's playing is. It, it's, it's so, it was so instinctive. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that I've had guys come in and try to play like that. It's just not, it's not here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Harley's bass sound comes from, comes from right in here, you know? Yeah, he's, so, he's, uh, that, that, that record. Now, what, one band that, that I wanted to ask you about um, that we don't talk a lot about on the show uh, is this particular band. And I know these are one of the guys that you, you've remained, and it's one of your personal favorites, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell us about the scatterbrain. Uh, Here comes trouble record. That might be my favorite heavy album I've ever done of all time. Because... And, and that's, this is another one that Howie hooked up, right? Yep. And, yeah, and I'll... that that was Paul playing guitar, right? Paul Nieder, yeah. Paul Nieder. Yeah, tell us about it. I'm and sorry. And Glenn, I forget Glenn's last name. Sorry, Glenn. I'm, I pray, I apologize. Um, well, the way this album came in was they're also great. They were also great musicians. Right. Paul, in particular, has a very great ear for music, and he listened to many great guitar players and records. So he did a lot of the pre-production, like literally wrote the drum parts. You know what I mean? And that was the first band that I worked with that came in and played the first heavy band I worked with that came in and played with a click track. And if you listen to that album, there's all kinds of time signatures and tempo changes in the, in these songs. Paul actually programmed all that on a drum machine. So the drummer had a, a template to play to. And, uh, you know, like a lot of drummers blah, 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 all over the place. And Paul's like, no, 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 I need you to lay down the beat and I need you to, to like, Give me some meat and potatoes because you know what I mean. And we did that album, and Paul came in with like fifteen or sixteen different guitars, about ten different guitar rigs, and we literally on, on the on. If you listen to that album, if you listen to the verse and chorus and the bridge on every song, they're all different guitar sounds on every part of every part of the song. We literally would pick up another guitar, another we would do the verses one guitar rig, then we. They have another rig set up and we'd pick up either a Les Paul or a Strat or whatever hollow body and we do that those parts and then solos so it, there's like five or six different guitar sounds going on in every song and we 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 were going over budget you know <laughs> we were going over budget so we had to send some some tapes to the to the record company to uh you know to let them know what we were doing and when how we heard it this, just, this, this, excuse me. This record was done for Relativity, correct? I believe so. Yeah. 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 I believe so. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. When uh, when Howie heard the record, what we were doing, he says, "I don't know what the fuck you guys are doing up there in Normandy." He goes, "But whatever it is, just keep fucking doing it." And that, <laughs> and and uh, I was told I was working with um, the guitar player from Aerosmith, um, the little Joe uh, Perry, um, Brad Whitford, Brad Bradford Whitford, yeah. And he told me that when this album came out. Steven Tyler grabbed this album, put it on the bus, and he, he wouldn't let anybody play anything else on the bus. He just played this album over and over again, which was like, wow. When I finally, when I was doing Peter Wolf's album, and Steve came to do some background vocals, we talked about it. And he wow. said, and he, and Brad said, those are some of the best guitar sounds I've ever heard in my entire life. And uh, now I, that was impressive for me, you know, to, to hear someone. I mean, those guys are, God, you know, they're, they're, they're rock and roll legends and gods. Especially, especially for them to say that they appreciated my work yeah. was a, in a whole different world. You know what I mean? Was was a big deal. For, was a big deal for me. That was a yeah. that was totally big deal for me. You know, yeah, so. that's uh, you know, Scatterbrain and Ludacris to a certain extent. Unfortunately, they've sort of been lost a little bit in the shifting sands of time. Yeah. You know, they, they don't they don't play out very often. You know, sometimes bands fall through the cracks and and and. That that that's a band that that kind of falls through. Falls well, through also, the also, I think they had I think they had a really big future, but unfortunately, when Scatterbrain came out, it was just around the time the Chili Peppers were really hot. Uh, Their right. music was kind of similar. Yeah, in that way, and it's I always make the the analogy. You, know, you know, it's like uh, the, the the Chili Peppers were considered the real deal. The real deal. You know what I mean? Sure. sure. So it's like some people might have looked at Scatterbrain as like the the 
like, oh, why am I going to listen to them when I can hear the when I can listen to the Chili Peppers? And unfortunately, that, unfortunately that happens, people that make happens. that distinction. In the, yeah. Instead of taking the music yeah. for what the music is, they'll kind of try to compare you to someone else. Yep. And, uh, and 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 music music gets lost. You know. Hey, you know, you know, I have a I have a video clip. I shot this at Normandy. Um, you weren't behind the board, Jamie Locke was, but uh -huh. it does it does have some of the studio in it. Take a peek at this. All right. Telephone's ringing. Oh yeah. Here you go. It's the Normandy fucking guitar room. Is he sick of it all there? <laughs> some of the best fucking graffiti. The Normandy guitar room. I shot this. You hear my voice. And look at look at that leeway M Y H C. If you go back a little bit, you'll see yes, sick of it all too in there. The big big big, big black letters. Normandy fucking guitar room. Bingo, there it is. Yeah, sick of it all. <laughs> yeah, love, boy, everybody got in on it's this, right? Crazy. Yeah, that was the thing. We always wanted everybody that recorded there to sign the wall. You know, and I guess wow, Leeway did "Born to Expire," "Desperate Measures," and "Adult Crash." There, and wow. "Adult Crash," yeah, wow. The, 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 fortunately for me, York, when Bordy when Bordy I did Bordy one Bordy album Bordy with a band, Bordy. they came back and wanted me to do another one and another one. Like the right. sick of it all, I did like a lot of records for them. Uh, yeah, um, but this is I, the room. This is the yeah. guitar room, and that's the main room, right? Yeah, that was originally the big the drum room back in the day, but it wound up being. It was says it was very tight, so it was really good to do the amp cabin in that room because mm -hmm. the, the acoustic. No, there wasn't a there wasn't a parallel wall in that room. Everything was all angled, yeah. so uh, the acoustics in that room were kind of dead, but they were really tight and it lended to really good solid bass in that room. Right. You know, so yeah, we use that. I used to use that, and I would use that room for vocals too sometimes. Yeah, I remember. I remember that room. Um, let me see what else we got. How about? Um, any recollections on record on on doing this Killing Time record, Bright Side at all? No. Yeah. Uh, I, if I heard the songs, if I could yeah. remember the songs, then then things would come to mind. But yeah, there was a, there was a lot of them. This was a time where I was doing ten hardcore albums a year. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, With like yeah. bands from Seattle were coming in and and all over the place. And it was some of it was sub, that sub pop stuff started happening. And it was, it was, it almost got to be like a factory. You know what I, you know what I did not know? You what? actually mixed this biohazard record, right? Uh, is that live in Hamburg? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I did that album at Electric Lady. Oh, you mixed it at Electric Lady? I mixed it at Electric Lady. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What, uh, what was it like working at Electric Lady? I mean, that place is rich in, 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 do you like that studio? Uh, yeah, I love that studio. That studio was great. Um, yeah. I originally, the first time I worked there was in, God, 1982. I was like 23 years old. Wow. And uh, I was doing it. There was a there was a band called John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band, which Come was on. basically Eddie and the Cruisers. Which is you know? basically like a New Jersey Springsteen sort of. Yeah, exactly. Like 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 uh, what, what do you call a um, residual fallout from Springsteen? Exactly. Like, that, that's Springsteen. another. That's another one. That bar, oh, that's the bargain Spring, basement, Bruce Spring, Springsteen. Springsteen yeah. pulled up. Springsteen pulled up the the John Cafferty's. The the uh, what was the other one? The, the Gary U.S. Bond. Yeah, exactly. And who's the other one I'm thinking Southside Johnny, right? Well, it's funny because we had this like. Well, at the time, we had this little MCI console at the at the Normandy, and right. it was really hard to get good bass out of that console because it just mm -hmm. didn't have it. So they, uh, so I went to New York to to do this uh, thing for John Cafferty. It was a uh, was um it was called Live at the Roxy, right? Right, and it was them playing live, and they wanted me to mix it, but I had to replace some sounds and stuff like that. So the bass needed to be replaced, and they had a big Neve there, uh, like uh, Love Is a Battlefield. Uh, all the Billy Idol stuff and uh, Big Bamboo Boom from from uh, from Hall and Oates. All I mean the the amount of records that were done on this console were were legendary. So I remember bringing up. I remember I always liked Bob Claremont's bass. Bass. He's an engineer. All his right. his bass always sounded great, and I could never figure out how to get that bass. Well, I plug the bass into this Neve console and I start turning the knob up, and all of a sudden this fucking bass comes out, and I looked over at the assistant. And I said. Claremont's not that good. He's just using one of these fucking things, and but no, that not nothing against Bob. He's a you know top three engineers on the planet. But uh, uh, it, it was like, oh wow, no wonder why I can't get this bass sound at Normandy because we're using this little crappy MCI console and they're using this vintage Neve. 
Hence, when I went back to the Normandy, things changed radically over there. We ended up getting a whole new world. Um, right. But uh, th that that was that was the first experience I had there. And then I became friends with Mary Campbell and worked there on and off. And then when I finally did this biohazard record, it was about the time I was uh, in the plans of moving to New York, you know. Yeah. And uh, that that studio, I mean, I mixed Prince there. I, I've, I've mixed Erica Badu there. Uh, Jay Z, uh, uh, Mary J. Bly, I worked with there, and it's still and it's still there. It's still a function. Yeah, studio. it's still there. It's still there. It, it's it's too bad because that was like the biggest rock studio on the planet. Yeah, and then hip hop came in, and it yeah. wound up being the biggest hip hop studio on the planet. Lost a little bit of its rock and roll character. Sure, but it's still like you know one of the top five studios. I've ever worked in in the world. Hey, there's that boombox in this picture. There's that boombox in Dallas. Then probably, God, that's 2007, 2006. Do do you? Still, I mean, it was in better I mean, shape back then. I know it's part of your technique, but literally, like when you work with Erica Badu and, and stuff, do you do you pull out the boombox and 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 say she asks that, for it? She asks really? for it. That's awesome. She's like, play, awesome. cause I, I mixed that song "Love of My Life" for her. We want that we you know that that we want a Grammy for, her. and uh, wow. I that well before that I had just done "Bag Lady" and stuff like that, and she was like, um, "What do you got this thing here for?" And I I was like, "Well, that's how I that's how I listen to my mixes and sure. check to see if it's going to sound good on the radio." And after after uh, "Love of My Life," every time I worked with her, and she it would be "Where's the, Where's the Box." Play for me ah, on that box. Play for great. me on that box because that's the radio. You know what I mean? That's the radio. Absolutely. And every time she liked it on that box, she loved it everywhere that she uh, that she played it. You know that makes sense. Hey, let me uh, do my last uh, sponsor break here. Let me shout out some sponsors. Uh, you know, do what you got to do. Give me five minutes, and we'll come back and we'll take some questions from around the world. Okay? Sure. Okay. Well, there you go. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Our 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 excuse me. Our guest today. Is Tom Soros? Hey, Jimmy Hazel, you out there? Hey, Jimmy, what's up, man? I got a shitty signal. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know you do. I know you do. Um, it, it's real choppy and it, it's kind of a little disruptive. We could try again. Let, let me do the sponsor break and I'll try to get you back on. I'll, I'll stay right? still. Stay still. Well, there you go. This is the Jimmy Hazel Show, and I am your co-host, Drew Stone. Uh, we are we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rust, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTF and Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, and since 1992, Generation Records. They've been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. Last but certainly not least, the Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in all... And they specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rollet, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. During this current never-ending pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook page and, of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. That said... Let me see what else we got to mention. You know, speaking of Jimmy Hazel, why don't I get to this real quick? Uh, Jet Saturday, Sunday, excuse me, January 16th. Another one of our shows down on the Bowery. It's free. It's a Sunday matinee. It's all ages. Fahrenheit 451 reunion. 24-7 Spies, Cropsy, and Iconicide. This is happening on Sunday, January 16th. We are excited about this. Come on down. It is free. That said, let me see. Why is 
Why is Craig Satari texting me? Hold on. What do you want? You want to come on the show? Come on the show, bro. <laughs> that said, um, what else do I got to mention? Um, if you're watching in a rerun, please subscribe to please subscribe to the page, the Stone Films NYC YouTube page, so you get alerts. The subscribe button is right there. There's a merch line underneath. Feel free to buy a piece of merch. Let's take some questions from around the world. I've been around. Oh, what did you say, Craig? Hold on. What is, let me see what Craig's what Craig's going on about. Let's see. Hold on. I meant to say, hold on. You know. Yeah, yeah. All right. We got that. I got it, Craig. I meant to say that that live we were already pros, but n- but not we weren't pros in the studio because that's what he shaped us into. Okay. I got that. Um let me see. What's up, bro? Are you with us, Jimmy? What's up, man? Hey, yeah, this this still is. Yeah, the delay thing's real choppy, man. It, it's really not working, man. So, that said, hey, man. Uh, I, hey, wish we could hear, I wish we could hear Jimmy. I know we could try again. We could try, but it, it's just bad, and we're just we're just going over the bad stuff over and over again. Um, let me see. Let me see if we got any questions. Questions for Tom. Um, let me see what's going on. What was the first show you ever went to? Me? Yeah. First music you ever saw. Deep Purple, 1974. Wow. And they, and there was a band called Tucky Buzzard and Savoy Brown opened for him at the Providence Civic Center. Savvy, Savvy Brown. Was it 1974? I think when Deep Purple had, um, I mean, Coverdale was singing. Yep, in it was just after Gillen left and Coverdale was there. Yeah, yeah, man. That's my favorite Deep Purple stuff is, is the Coverdale. I think it was stuff. the Burn album. I think it might have been the Burn ah! album. Yeah, I think it might have been that album. That was that was a phenomenal experience, man. And the bass player I was, was, I, was, was, I, was yeah. I was 13. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Here's the question <laughs> from... This is a question from Sebastian Carson. How do you see the future for music production and hardcore music? Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I know I know what I'd like it to see. I'd like it to see see it be a little more refined because there's no reason for it not to be more refined but still have the same edge that it had before. Right. Um, my problem with hardcore albums was that they were always made they, – they never got the due – they never get their due because they were because it's such angry sometimes music that people thought it didn't didn't need to have uh, the polish of a really great sounding record. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just like throw it together, put it out there because it's just angry kids doing angry music. Right. And it doesn't it didn't have to be that. And I tried when I when I started making my records, I tried making them sound like big dollar records. You know what I mean? So, and uh, I mean, I would love to see hardcore come back like big. I just don't know uh, what the guys would sing about, to tell you the truth. I don't know. I don't yeah. know what, what, I mean, there's a ton of stuff to, to look at with what's going on on the planet right now. Yeah, but, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a different, it's a different world now. It, it, it's, it's a different thing, you know? I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, this album I'm doing with John, it's, it's, it's kind of like poppy punk with a girl mm-hmm. singing. And the songs are like you know, uh, it's, it's it's a lot about social social things, you know, like um, the planet's dying, you know, stuff like that. You know, there I you I see the, a lot of that in her music. You know, here's um, Johnny Hendo says, "Is it true Normandy is haunted?" Yes, Normandy Man. was haunted. Is that right? Yeah, Normandy was haunted. I, I, I remember. Was, we... I, well, I we there was a ghost at the studio. We used to call him Norman because it was Normandy. Yeah, I remember but this. I remember. He used this. to wear. He had brown. He had brown pants and brown, and brown like dark brown shoes, and that's all I ever saw of him. But um, a lot of strange things would happen in there. You hear things going on in the back where there was no one there. I remember um, that. I've seen bulls fly out of out of out of sinks and land on the ground when you when you cursed them. 
I, um, if you, you know, you'd be in the control room and all of a sudden you'd see something go by the door and you, and, and every once in a while you catch it and you'd catch like his back leg and it was a brown pair of pants and his really dark pair of shoes. And you go out there and, uh, the, 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 the motion sensor would be on, but there'd be nobody there. And wow. between the studio, there was an upstairs where the band used to be able to stay. There was like this little I alley. Rem I remember it well. It was so, it was even in, in, in winter, I mean, even in summer, there was this cold feeling that was in that one little spot. And I would probably have to say the, the, the craziest thing was I was working with a guitar player, producer, his name was Leroy Radcliffe. God rest his soul. Love you, Leroy. He just passed away. He was the guitar player for Robin Lane and the Chop Busters. Yes, of and course. I, I did a lot of work with him. And we would be working, and one night we're working in the studio, and we kept seeing Norman go by the door, you know? And it was maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he said, it's distracting you. So he closed the door, and we're sitting there working, and all of a sudden we both looked at the same time, and there's the doorknob turning. Whoa. So he grabs the doorknob and opens up the door, and there's nobody there. And we just, we because the door made like a little sound when you touch the knob, you know? Yeah. It wasn't like a really expensive door. And, and he, we both did this at the same time. And he looked at me and goes, the fucking, the fucking knob's turning. And, then, right. and he went over and he grabbed it and opened it up and there was nobody there. And, and he just looked at me and I was like, Norman liked Leroy. Norman, Norman was always around when Leroy was in the studio. That's cool. Yeah. Here's, um, here's another one uh, from Baz. We admire your skills. Who do you admire when it comes to producing and engineering? Uh, I would have to say my favorite engineer was uh, a guy named Bruce Widan, who passed oh. away. He did like, he was he did he did like the first stereo recording, uh, Duke Ellington, um, mm -hmm. the, the, all the Michael Jackson records. Uh, you know he was he was um, uh, Quincy Jones's personal like engineer. You know what I mean? Oh, I see him, Tom Dowd, who did uh, you know Allman the, Brothers, Allman yeah, Brothers, Allman Brothers, Brothers uh, he did you know, all those great Allman Brothers bands. Calm down, did Derek and the Dominoes. Yeah, well, not only that, he did like a lot of Aretha Franklin stuff. I mean, Cream, was, Cream, Cream. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, the, I tell you, the second, the third record I ever bought was a Cream record. I didn't I'm, know. I'm a big, I, I'm a big Tom I Dowd fan. I, I didn't, I didn't know it was. I didn't know it was Tom Dowd. Um, yeah. I, 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 I admire a lot of a lot of guys. I really do, you know. But yeah. I, I, since I come from such an old school. Mm -hmm. of learning the stuff that i heard from like like bob claremont uh, let me speak about him for uh, just briefly i always wonder why hall and oates records sounded so great so i kept listening to him over and over and over again and i realized that bob would always tune the drums in the key of the song wow and i started doing that and everything just the drum sounds and all the all the guitar sounds and everything just got so much better because I would only tune the drums in the key of the song. That's like John said, I would take me forever to get drum sounds because I would tune the drums and I would have lots of drums to pick from depending on what key of the song was in the drum kit. So sometimes it would be a three piece kit. Sometimes it'd be a five piece kit. Sometimes it'd be two drums, depend on whatever, whichever drum sounded sonically and, and harmonically right in the song. Sure. And I, you know, and, and I, you see a lot of people, they do, they see, you listen to the guitar solo, they sound great. Listen to the drums, you sound great. Then you put it all together, and there's something that's off about it. It's because you got the drums ringing in major seconds to the key of the song, so the guitars don't sound in tune because you got tom toms ringing in the wrong notes. You know what I mean? So, so I just noticed that if you had everything ringing harmonically in the right thing, it got that big orchestra sound naturally. So, uh, kudos to Bob Clearmount for Bob for, Clearmount. I, I don't know if he did it purposely or what, but maybe that was just his genius. Didn't even think he was doing it, but I just noticed that his drums are always in tune to the song. Like the the kick would be the the root of the song, and the snare would be like the fifth of the song, and the hi hat would sound like it was the seventh of the song, you know. And uh, I just started doing all that, and uh, all of a sudden my drums started sounding like professional big drums, and my records all of a sudden just had a whole different sound to them because of the fact that everything was ringing true in key in, in, in the key of the song, you know? Makes sense. Our resident historian Chucky Brown asks, can he speak on getting his first Grammy nomination? I believe it was for the number one hit Good Vibrations from Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch back in the 90s. Yeah, uh, I think I was telling you that uh, 
I was in New York doing some band. I forget what it was. And I was driving back to Normandy. It was it was at night, maybe 10 o'clock at night. And I was driving up the West Side Highway. And I had the radio on and Good Vibrations came on. And I was like, oh, my God, I've heard this song so many fucking times. <laughs> so I switched the channel and it was on that station. It was on five. I kept switching the channel. It was on five stations at the same time. And I was like, wow. And the hair That's on my head. That's the hair hit. on my arms stood up and I went, wow. And sure enough, oh, you know, a couple of weeks later, it was the number one hit. And got, that album got nominated for a Grammy. We lost out to uh, uh, Can't Touch This that year. Wow. wow. But Go uh, figure. But that was, yeah, that was quite, that was quite a, quite a thing there. I, and, I, and I, knew... I just want to say a quick tie in is that uh, a friend of mine, Scott Calvert, that I used to work for and, um, I, I second AD for him. We did Eric B and Rakim, Follow the Leader and Microphone Fiend. He ended up directing Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, Good Vibrations. Oh, really? And then he went on to direct the film, The Basketball Diaries. And he was the one that insisted that Marky Mark get a role in The Basketball Diaries, thus launching Marky Mark's it's career, acting yeah. career. Well, you know, what, you know what's funny was Donnie Wahlberg, who produced that record, Right, you were friends uh, with Don because you worked out. You worked uh, yeah, on new kids. Yeah, me and Donnie, me and Donnie are still friends today. Yeah. Um, but there was in the breakdown of that song in the video, he's punching a punching bag. Yeah. And I put this big sound on the bass drum, boof, like that for that uh -huh, part, uh -huh. and that's what inspired him to use that. And he even told Donnie, "Man, that was such a great video cue." That, and then I started thinking about when I was mixing songs that were going to be in in, in videos. Yeah. Of sounds that would make good video cues because of that, because of that one comment, you know? That, that, that's great. Um, Adam asks, what's your favorite piece of gear? Is that a fair question to ask? Yeah. Um, my favorite piece of gear would be my microphone collection. Nice. Um, but that doesn't probably mean anything to a lot of people nowadays. Uh, I would say... Um, the clock that I use to pro, to clock Pro Tools is a very very expensive clock. That that's one of my fit because that really makes digital sound more like analog to me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I like I, I like a lot of I don't know if they want to know about plugins and stuff like that. I don't know if that's well. Yeah. Well, S for. Sebastian asks an opinion on plugins for reamp and program drums. So I guess I guess people are asking about plugins. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I like the stuff called um, uh, uh, Amp Amp Hub. It's something that's relatively it's new to me, because mm -hmm. when I started doing these uh, these 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 hard albums at home, mixing at home, the guitar sounds weren't that good. So I went, like when I told Nick from Terra, send me send me direct guitars. I started getting into it, and that Amp Hub thing works great. Where you got all these different amplifiers, and then you got all these different cabinets, and you can actually arrange them in an amp cabin. You know what I mean? Right. Um, uh, I use that a lot. Um, uh, as far as reamping, yeah, yeah, there's that, but also when you get stuff like that, you kind of have to put it in, in, in a place to give it a little depth. Mm -hmm. So either you could use a, like a, a really high quality digital reverb, like an Altiverb made by audio ease that, uh, that you can use like a short room to put some, um, some, pre some, some, uh, short reflections after it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes it sound like, you're listening to the amplifier in the room instead of just like really close microphones like you see on the plugin. You know what I mean? Sure. Stuff like that. Or if you have an acoustic space, you just, uh, you know, send it out to a speaker and mic the speaker. And that helps a lot. It gives it a realism that you, that did, my problem with digital is so it's very one dimensional to me. Yeah. You know, the, hence the, the fancy clock I have gives it depth. And then using instead of just using reverb and stuff like that to try to make a sound, using a, a sequence of shorter, shorter like early reflection delays, gives it the uh, the 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 appearance of you listening to it in a room. You know, you know, I mean, in, in, interesting. You 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 bring up in those terms. You know, growing up in New York City, you know, we hated disco. You know, and and now, you know, of course. I hear a lot of this disco stuff, you want to call it disco, whatever, which is really, it was really, most of it's really very R&B that was recorded in the seventies. And I love it now You I, because I can hear the warmth of the room. Yeah. I can hear the room. Like I can actually, 
I hear the room and, and I love a lot of that disco stuff now because it's just so analog and so vibrant, you know? Well, you know, about the records, the records that I did, that was one big thing about it. You know, they were all in, they were all two inch. Those things are all, most of those records were 48 track, two inch, two, two, 48 track, two up. inch, right. And yeah. um, if you're an analog, come from the analog world like I, like I do, mm -hmm. you can learn, you learn how to, what we call loading the tape recorder. Certain things you record at certain levels to make things sound a certain way when they're played back. Like if I had a really bad bass player, I if if you if you record him a certain level on the tape, when he comes back off tape, he sounds like he's a little more in time because 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 of the compression and the way the waveform gets cut off. Wow, so that's you, interesting. So by how you loaded loaded the tape, if a guy was going duh, 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 but he didn't have a really good <laughs> full sound. Right. You could load the tape a certain way so it came back sounding like boop, 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 boop. You know what I mean? And you wouldn't hear as much definition, but he would groove better with the. And I could make a bass player groove a lot better by how I loaded the tape. That's you interesting. Know? He, here's, here's, um, let me, uh, here's a good one. And I have, I have a visual to go with it. Um, Thomas says, how, how does someone survive being a drill sergeant for, bands like Marauder and Crown of Thorns. And let me just quickly put up, hold on, it's not behaving. Yeah, uh, Marauder and Crown of Thorns. And of course, what we're referencing here is this record, uh, Master Killer. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, uh, the Crown of Thorns record, uh, Mentally, Mentally Vexed. Let me put that up a second so we get the visual. I mean... Oh yeah, okay. How oh, does yeah. so, how does someone survive being a drill sergeant? With, I mean, dealing with some of these hardcore personalities. Well, you know. luckily, I'm not, and I'm I'm not a two year old horn guy. But by that time, I had done enough hardcore records that were mm -hmm. that were good records that were good, that sounded good. Yeah. That when these guys were coming to me, they were like, "We got to do what do we do to make our record sound great?" So when I would say. Hey man, we're gonna work on you know what I mean. You gotta work with the timing, and you gotta tune your guitar, and you gotta do this, and you da da da. da. They, they, it was a lot easier to get guys with strong wills to conform because the, when they did it, they saw the they, they saw the, their own progress, and they saw the, how the record was coming out. So so it wasn't like uh, I was some kind of like god or anything like that. I'm not that uh, at all. Well, also when you come up when listen when you come up to a place like Normandy. It's it's showtime, and you need to put your game face on. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was up there three times. I was up there with uh, I executive produced, and I was managing Marauder at the time. And when we recorded Marauder Master Killer, that Paris Mayu from the Chromags produced, mm -hmm. I was up there again with um, Paris and Harley when they did the White Devil recording. I was there for that, and I was up there. You weren't around. I was up there with Fury of Five when I was managing them. Fury of Five recorded there with Jamie. I, 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 with Jamie. So I, I recorded and lived up at, uh, up at Normandy, and I still have in my mind's eye that freaking convenience store up the block there, uh -huh. being, uh, being there, you know, one, two in the morning, like, and staring out into the night, you know? Strange. Well, you know, the, fort yeah. Yeah, the fortunate ahead. thing about Normandy was there was nothing there. It was like Mayberry. Yeah. So there was right. nothing to do there but record, record. You yeah. know what I mean? There was right. nothing there. So, when, so it was a good place to go to get bands out of the city yeah, and I mean, I, I, I mean, I worked with some bands that never even left New York City, right? You know what I mean? And when they, sure. the, I remember, I remember Harley coughing when he was breathing because of the air was so clean, it would actually <laughs> make him cough, you know. Right. So, so there was nothing there to do but to record. And you know, when you saw the progress, it's like, all right, I'm a drill sergeant, and we're going to do it this way. And da, 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 da. all right, now guys, now perform. And sometimes with hardcore, you got to piss them off. Mm -hmm. You got to piss them off to get them to perform. With with some aggressiveness and anger, you know. Sure. It's not all. It's not all fucking unicorns and, and, and <laughs> it's not in rainbow. It's, no farts, it's not all I mean? uni unicorns and in, in, in rainbows. Yeah, it's um, not, whatever that is saying is. Uh, Adam says, Tom, I really like your attitude towards band, especially not well put together. Very inspiring. Thank you. All right. That, Thank that you very much. Sense. Um, let me see. Uh, there was another a couple other ones. Uh, this was interesting. I, I'm not sure. Hold on. Uh, oh, this, this is Roy Ramon. How different is it mixing something like the Rakim record compared with something heavier like Sick of It All? I mean, 
Okay, when I mixed Rock Kim's la uh, album there, uh, um, he wasn't around much. They sent me the tracks. I was there with the executive producer. Yep. Uh, I would uh, I would mix, send the the mix to Rakim, who I think he was lived in Connecticut or something like that, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would send back comments, and then I would do the changes. And uh, it was it was nice because he trusted me. Do you know what I mean? He trusted me. Uh -huh. That's a whole different world than when you're doing a band like Sick of It All. That's a band. You have to bond with the band. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like I would I would purposely eat these greasy pork sandwiches, right? Like uh -huh. like bacon and egg sandwiches, which would like freak Pete out. You know what I mean? And uh -huh. he, he we'd make a joke out of it, but it was um there was you know that's a that, that's a that's an experience where it's like a team. Oh, God, I hate the fucking word team, but it's like a team. You know what I mean? When you come together to do an album, it's a you all got to come together for the same purpose. Sure. And everybody's together. Sure. You fight. You fart. You know. You piss each other yeah. off. You drink together. You get drunk. You make up. You da da da. And all that comes out in the all that comes out in the record. Sometimes I'd be the nicest guy in the world. All the time I was fucking little Caesar. And if yeah. it was to get someone to be so pissed off that they would go, they would play like that, then if that's what it took, then that's what I did. If not, like with with the spies, I could just sit back. I would just. Uh, because it was the easiest to get the drum sounds, easiest to get the bass sounds, easiest to get the guitar sounds. And Jimmy had all these guitars that was just pop, 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 pop. He had 20 different guitar sounds at the touch of his foot. And I was all I had to do was just fucking run the tape recorder and make sure that, you know, and if I had some ideas, Jimmy listened to them. Sometimes he liked them, sometimes he didn't. And one thing about with Jimmy, what he was producing, it's like I try stuff, and a lot of a lot of people don't want you to oh, what are you doing? Put that on my vocal. It's like, well, I'm if I'm doing I'm doing eighty percent of you. Let me do twenty percent of me. You know what I mean? And 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 that's what's going to come to because you never you I've never heard these songs before. I'm hearing them different than you're hearing them. Sure, you've been sure. hearing them for months and months and months, and that's yeah. the only way you think they should be. I'm the new guy coming in. Let me give you my twenty percent. It's only a button. I can always shut it off. Yeah. But if you never let me do it, then you don't know what it could be. Well, you're also bringing me in to yeah. work on this. It's like my dad used to say, you know, when, you know, my dad was a film director, you know, working and he'd have the agency start, you know, giving him a hard time. And he would say, hey, you hired me to do exactly. what I do. Exactly. Let me do what I do. Let me do what I do. Why did you come here? I've said that to many people. Why'd you come here? You want a button pusher? Do you want, did you want, me? Did you want me? Do you want yeah. me or you want someone else? Sure. If you want someone else, what do you want me? If you, you came here because you wanted me to do your record, then let me do me. Yeah. Otherwise... You're wasting my fucking time and yours, you know? Hey, by the way, here's the picture of me and Eric B. and Rakim oh my back God. on the Follow the Leader music video back in the day, right? This is mm -hmm. what, this is, this is the real, this is the real deal right here. <laughs> well, see, those, those, those are guys that they made so many records. They knew what was good and what was bad, too. You I know? think, I think, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sure. good producers, most of the time, good producers don't say a freaking word to me. Yeah. Unless they don't like something. Because that's right. what they, they want you to do you. Yeah. You know, and, and and if they if they don't like something, they'll say something. Otherwise, they're just gonna sit back and say, "Let me see what the guy comes up with." You know? Yeah. yeah me, that, that means... And it's like a turn around. I go, "You're going in the right direction. Just keep going." Or it's like all those stuff. You hey, you know what? I think we're kind of going in the wrong direction. Let's try this instead. Where that's yeah. when they get involved, and then you take their idea and go in their direction, and you still wind up incorporating your own stuff in there too. But a lot of times, the best producers I ever worked with don't say don't say much. They don't. They just let you do your job. You know, or, or, yeah, right. Or, or Obviously, I, they came to you because they've heard your work and they know what you're capable of. So it's like, I want you to bring you. I don't want you to bring that band to me. I want you to bring you to my to my project. I think I think an example of that is like Rick Rubin, who who I, I like look at, like, what does this guy do? Like, like I for me, I, I didn't understand. What does he really he seems he to bring like, out the best of what they have. He and talk, makes he 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 talks conceptually and spiritually with bands it's a whole it's not like hey we're gonna do what we're gonna do in the studio but he like he like becomes a guru to bands it's a yeah. totally different thing it's really interesting you know um and speaking of which here's uh brett says um few producers understand the difference between the hardcore and metal sound was it natural for you or more learned um i or, or, or was there nothing, or was it? Or, there was or, or nothing. Was there... Yeah, to be honest with you, there was nothing. What it was was, see, I 
that's the problem with the engineers that are around today. It's like you're a mixing engineer, you're a recording engineer, you're a hip hop engineer, you're an right. R&B engineer. Right, right. I used to do country. I used to do rock and roll. I used to sure. do all kinds of stuff. When you grew up, you became an like Tom Dowd. You became an engineer. You learned how to record right. things, and like like the, this this record I'm doing with John right now. Perfect example. I'm using all these amp simulators and john first i was like well tell me you know we'll get the drum sound then you give me that it shouldn't take that long and all of a sudden i was like nah, i can't do that with this band you know, i can't do that with the her every song is different so all right. of a sudden it's like every 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 mix i send john it's like what the hell kind of guitar sound is that that's a whole different so i was like well that's the way i hear it. i don't hear that with these these metal guitars on it you know i i hear it with this is the kind of guitars i hear on it you know metal guitars are uh a, a, a beefier, you know, hard guitars, hard, hardcore guitars tend to be a little brighter and zizzier, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the but sometimes mixing the two together, you know what I mean, is when yeah. you blend the sounds together, and that's when you get a sound that's different than everybody else's. And with that with the player and his tone makes the makes the band sound. You know? That makes that make that makes a lot of sense. Hey man. I want to thank you for coming on the show. That, that you know, was great. I, 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 was I told you, too. I told you we were going to have a good time. I was nervous because I, I don't do these I things know, much, buddy. and I've I always know. been the person behind the glass, not in front of it. Yeah. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And yeah. uh, if there's and I'm, anything, I'm honored, anybody, I'm honored for you to come on, man. You, you, you were involved in so many iconic New York hardcore records and so much music that that I love. You know, to this day. Uh, do you want to thank anybody or shout anybody out on the way out? Uh, I'd like to shout out uh, Howie Abrams for mm -hmm. first because he taught me a lot about about the hardcore scene. Mm. Uh, I know a lot of people are gonna think I would think this is weird, but I'd like to shout out Chris Williamson too. That's Cause, that's because he was man. my first. He was my first like introduction to the New York hardcore scene. That's and legit, I didn't understand man. it. I didn't understand yeah. it. He kind of mm -hmm. taught me that. Plus, he was he was brilliant in his way. Of, of of like I mean I learned a lot of producing these records from him only because when but, we but let's first... let's let's recap for a second Chris Williamson Wargasm Leeway Chromags Cro yeah and I'll tell you what he pissed off the Chromags so much and brought yeah. out so much anger on the, with those guys that that's that that's that record you know what I mean that's that record and it was like those he would literally put those guys at each other's throats. You know what I mean? On purpose. Right. And and like to the point where they would walk out, leave the studio, you know, and then come back and be so I want to kill fucking Harley. I want to kill Paris. Da, da, da. And uh and then they uh, play. Yeah, and then and PD Hines was just a rock. And, as a matter of fact, and I, I don't think that I that drums, the drums on that best wishes. Uh, the last time I saw PD Hines, I just went up to him, I just said, Best wishes, bro. The drums on best. I just was like Pfft. Petey Hines and the drum sound, man. Fuck. Well, you see, the, you know what? We you know what he had. He had, you know, the hardcore beat. Boom, that, but that, boom, that, but that, boom, yeah. that. He's one of the only drummers on all the hardcore bands I ever worked with who could keep that beat and make it feel that way. Because inevitably, drummers get nervous and that boom, that, but that, boom, that, but that, boom, but that, boom, that, but that, boom, that, but that, boom, that, but that, boom, that, but it's the same, it's the same pattern. Boom, that, but that, 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 but that, become that. And it would screw up. It would screw up the, the groove of the song. Petey Hines would boom tap, boom tap, boom tap, boom tap, boom tap, boom tap, boom tap. No matter what he did, he came right back to that same groove. You know, the Mackie's like that too. You know, Mackie's like that. Dave Desenzo is is, is retarded like that. Yeah, you know, I, you know? I, and I, I know we're saying goodbye, but we're, we're jumping back in for a second. I mean, I, I know you've probably in your experience, um, drummers are a big thing, and. I know that Dave Desenzo was like your go-to guy, and I don't want to mention bands' names or yeah. anything like that. But there was a couple of bands that just came in, and the drummers just couldn't play with a click track and couldn't cut it. And and your call was to Dave Desenzo, who who was in the Chromags, correct? Yeah, I would run it by the band first. I'm mean, usually the leader of the quote unquote leader of the band. I would say this isn't working. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. You, and then well, we want this. I said, well, you're not going to get that. So yeah. this is an option for you. You decide what you want to do. Right. And inevitably, well, who did it? Well, he did, who did, who, who's, who, who's he played drums on? And it's like, well, you know, it's not, uh, he played drums on this. Everybody knew he played drums on the Cormac record. Right. Oh, that's him? Call him. It would be called, <laughs> you know? And Dave would come down 
he would listen to the song, he would chart it out on a big piece of white paper, go out there and say, ready, two, three, four, and play it. And he's well, like, Dave was a pro. Dave was a pro. He went to well, Berkeley, Dave's, right? Yeah, Dave's a professor. He's a professor at Berkeley. He's now he's he is? A, he's he's uh I've recorded Billy Cobham, Steve Smith, Vinny Caliuto, Harvey Mason. Wow. And Dave Desenzo is right in the top three. Wow, you pulled the Vinny Caliuto card. That's deep. Yeah. He's that guy's you know, that's I, the guy. Cool. Like Dave, Dave Desenzo, as far as abilities and his his just uh, knowledge of the of the of the instrument and how it works in music, sure is uh is 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 beyond beyond it's 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 magical to watch that guy play drums. It really is absolutely. You know? uh, anybody else you want to shout out? Oh God, I'd like to shout out my sister for getting me involved in this mess. Yeah. Um, did thanks, your sister Anna. did your sister go on to to work in the music business? No, she ended up having a kid, and uh, and we the way you know, you know the way studio life is. You're in the sure. studio 100, 100 hours a week, hundred twenty hours a week. It's not for you me. Can't raise a child. You can't raise a child being in the studio hundred hours yeah. a week. You just can't. Yep. That's one of the reasons I don't have children. I chose yeah. to work in the studio, sure. and my, you know, just briefly, my dad died when I was young, and mm. I grew up without a father. So I wasn't going to have children and not be there for them, basically. Sure. You know, so. Uh, there hey, was that. Tell, hey, tell us about, you know, we didn't touch on the work that you're doing for Terror and Scotty. Tell us about what you're well, doing. I did that. Album. I got a phone call. Actually, I got a, a Facebooky thing from him, from this guy, Nick. Mm -hmm. Right. So I tried to reply to it. I didn't reply right away. Uh, kind of like that instant message you sent me or whatever yeah, yeah. thing that was. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I tried to reply to him, and it said Facebook removed it. Ah. So I thought it was just some bullshit, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. And then about, I don't know, maybe eight, six or eight months later, I got a phone call from AJ. Hey, Tom, there's this band called Terra, and mm -hmm. the guy named Nick, and he wants you to do their out. He wants you to mix, mix their album. Da, 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 da. And then it dawned on I said, you know what? I think that's this thing that I got from Facebook. Uh -huh. He got me in touch with Nick. And from that, Nick was like, I need you to I need you to mix our album. Would you be interested? Is it I need it to be a big, heavy metal sounding album, kind of like the way you did the Chromags album. You know what I mean? Like I need it to be big and not hardcore, but like almost almost like you know how Ozzy's big records are big and sounding like that, kind of mm -hmm. like that. So I said, Yeah, we started talking and he goes, Oh, I'm almost done with, with this and that, and da da da. And I said, all right, well, just do me a favor. He goes, I got direct guitars. I says, you do? Beautiful. So he sent me the direct guitars with his amp sounds. And uh, the drums weren't that good, but I ended up doing my thing with the drums. And um, and and, and that, then they loved the album. You know, they ended up loving the album. And, uh, good. This, and Scott, you know, Scotty had his, his, his things that he needed for his vocals and stuff. And there was a little thing going back and forth with, Scotty wanted the uh, the vocals really, really, really loud, hmm. and it got to the point where it was like it was taken away from the size of the of the songs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it was almost like a like a pop mixing it like a pop record. Yeah. And then we ended up bringing the vocals down a little bit, and then and those guys, I would send it to them, and they decided, you guys decide what you're going to do, what you want me to do. I said, but there can't be five producers on the album. They can only be just one producer on the album. So I got to deal with one guy. <laughs> you guys to sort it out. Let me know what you want, and then tell me what to do, and I'll do what you want me to do. And then ended up working that way. I, I did some of it with Nick, some of it with Scott, and uh, the, I, I know they're happy with the record because I still get phone calls from Nick. Hey man, what's going on? We're going to be in New York. Uh, uh, that was that was a fun project to work on. That was a good. fun project to work on. Well, all right, man. Listen, have a good night. Thank you. You're welcome back anytime. For the opportunity. Tom. Hey, if anybody needs anything mixed. I don't know how they'd get in touch with me other than my email, but uh, well, I don't know. well, the, the the you're on Facebook, aren't you? I'm on Facebook. I don't know if it's easy to find me. I don't. I'm not a big. You know, I know. Man. I don't post things on Facebook. I look I, at things. It took me a while to fit, to track you down, man. I'm not on the. Tw I'm not on Twitter. You you're know, not I mean? on Instagram. I, I know. I'm not, man. I'm not on any of that stuff. And most of the time, you I mean, gotta I'm really the, want it. You gotta really. To, you gotta really to, want. <laughs> Drew, I used to complain about seeing fucking puppies and cats, and now I wish I saw puppies and cats on Facebook. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, if, uh, if right. anybody needs to get a hold of me, real for real, R E E L, the number four, R E E L at AOL.com. If anybody gets in touch with you and they can't yep. find me, you know how to put them in touch with me. And I reach out I, to me and I'll steer you to Tom. Have a good right. evening, Tom. I'll talk to you Thank soon. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening to my bullshit. 
Hope I uh, gave uh, I was a little bit entertaining, and uh, great. Uh, hopefully great. maybe somebody got some inspiration to make some great records. I think they did. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to me soon, Joe. Thank you. Right. My pleasure. Well, there you go. Fun show with Tom Suarez. Made a lot of those records we love, right? Just want to remind everybody that this Sunday coming up is David Ellison. And uh, this should be interesting. Fortunately, I got to say, I'm glad that uh, that Dave's done a bunch of other podcasts and shows before he's coming on here, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, you know. Yeah, Riley, for sure. Uh, absolutely, buddy. Um, Tom's a great guy. And, uh, you know. Yeah, he's like the A team. You, it, it, yeah, Tom's like the A team. If you can, if you can, if you can find him, you can hire him, right? So, yeah, that that's great, man. And 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 I have some fond memories of being up there in Normandy with Marauder and and Paris and and uh, and Fury of Five and stuff like that. So so that's cool. I want to wish everyone a happy holiday tomorrow. Um, listen, whatever it is, man, you know. It's a chance for, to get together with family and all that. That's what's up. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, it was. It was good to get an engineer's perspective and producer's perspective on hardcore. Yeah, Dave's going to be good, Tim. Looking forward to it. Hey, listen, like, whatever, man. I don't get hung up on all this, you know, uh, Columbus Day, and Thanksgiving. And, you know what? It's a chance to see family and, and a chance to see your loved ones and, and a chance for us all to get together. So I wish you all the best. Um, until, uh, until next time, do good things. Yes. Thank Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, D Riley. I love you, bro. And yo, Bob Riley, yo, murderers row. And we're doing a high in the mighty reunion. And, and I'm so excited that you're on the bill. The show hasn't been announced yet. It's going to be at the Bowery electric. We're doing a high in the mighty reunion. Bob Riley and Murderer's Row is on the bill. Super excited about that. Don't forget Johnny Rock's band is playing uh, at, at Lucky 13. Uh, thank you all, Roy, Roy Ramone. All of you, man. Come on now. You know, what can I say? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm a lucky dude. I'm, we are doing something that we love doing. Let's leave it at that. Do good things and good things will come to you. <laughs>